They seem to have a few people gone wandering, but I'm sure they'll all wander back at some point. Uh, so, if I could just have your attention, we're going to have a couple of minutes of uh, the video, and then we are going to go into this afternoon session. So, I'm sorry it didn't play before lunch, but we now have worked out the problem. Okay, so thank you. The first time I saw a blue whale. Oh, look, look. Oh. Wow. I followed them since childhood. What do you think it's from? Is it from a ship? I could see plastic everywhere. We were in what we thought was a relatively pristine environment. I started to wonder what was happening in oceans elsewhere on the planet. Growing up, my world was the ocean. It's where I feel the most spiritual. As a freediver, it was the place where I proved myself to myself. Finally, have the opportunity to pay the sea back. Only a fraction of the plastic that we produce is recycled. This is never going to degrade. It's got nowhere to go. This was something that these animals, they were forced to endure because it was man-made and we'd put it into their environment. The record is 276 pieces of plastic inside of one 90-day-old chick. If the plastics are in the food chain for the dolphin, they're also in our food chain. Exactly. Communities are built on these landfill sites. So sweet potatoes, corn, sugar cane. All growing on 40 years of garbage. Do you have anything not wrapped in plastic? No. No. <laughs> we have to make our life better for our kids' children. Change is possible. It starts with us. Hello, good afternoon to all of you. Uh, I'm Pascal Bouton, from a member of the Competitive Commission. We are beginning the section of this afternoon with performance in hot and humid environment. And we will have two speakers. The first one is Ida Svensson from Norway. Ida presents this morning the altitude training. So uh, it's not necessary to reintroduce her, Ida. Okay, and I want to introduce Kay Winkert from Germany. He is a sports physiologist and is working at the University of Ulm in Germany. He is a specialist of uh, diagnostic performance and is working with Gunnar Graf and Jürgen Steinecker. He is, uh, supports the juniors under 23 and a part of the Elintif of Germany. So, I have the pleasure to introduce Ida and Kay. Okay, so I'm going to start the session with uh, just a little bit of an introduction, both in terms of how heat and humidity influence performance, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about, particularly about heat acclim uh, acclimation, how athletes can prepare to perform in these types of climate. And uh, you just had a session on the kind of the Tokyo climate, but we've known since the Olympic Games were announced in Tokyo, we've known that this will be a challenge, particularly for the endurance sports. And in Tokyo, uh, in the period when the Olympic Games are going to be held, is a, it's in the middle of the hottest part of the year in Tokyo. So two years ago, there was a heat wave in Japan, well, actually a year and a bit ago, uh, where thousands were hospitalized with heat stroke and actually quite, a, I think about 100 people died. And even in a normal summer, so this is uh, 31st of July this year, 
we see that te the temperature and humidity are quite extreme. So one year before the rowing finals, the temperature was 34 degrees and the humidity was 77%. And it's this combination of humidity and temperature that is actually really challenging. When the humidity gets high, it means that when your athletes sweat, the sweat can't evaporate from the skin in the same way. So you remove one of the body's most important mechanisms for cooling and regulating body temperature. So this com combination of heat and humidity gives uh, a heat index. So the actual kind of the heat that your athlete would experience of 50 degrees Celsius. So it means that Tokyo is actually going to be the hottest and most challenging uh, Olympic Games ever in terms of climate. So we tested quite a few of our athletes in these kinds of conditions. Uh, we focused mainly on endurance sports because we know that that is where the challenge is going to be the greatest. The longer the duration of the event, the more uh, negative performance, uh, more negative effect he has on performance. So these bars, these, uh, each of these bars is one athlete. These are, uh, are basically all of our Olympic medal hopes in endurance sports from Norway. Uh, and each of these athletes, they performed a lactate profile test, first in normal temperate conditions, and then in Tokyo conditions. So it, they, it was 33 degrees, I think, and 75% humidity. And what we see is that there's an average performance decrement, that is the speed or power output at threshold of 6.3%. And we also see that there's a huge ind in individual variation. So some athletes, they might only have a 2% per uh, performance decrement, where we see other athletes who actually have a 15% reduction in performance. And included in these, these bars, I think three or four of these bars are rowers. There's a couple of sprint kayakers, there's some triathletes, and there's some cyclists. So we have a, a range of endurance sports. But we see that for everyone, there is a reduction in performance in this time, type of climate. So we can talk a little bit about why performance is impaired in the heat. The primary reason is because the body will always prioritize homeostasis. So it will always prioritize to try and keep body temperature between 36.5 and 37.5 degrees, which is kind of its normal operating conditions. As soon as your body temperature starts to increase, uh, the body will send blood to your skin to try and cool you down. That means that there is less blood going to your muscles and therefore less oxygen going to your muscles. So that means that at the same power output, your athlete's heart rate will be higher, the blood lactate production will be higher, and they will feel more tired. There's also obviously an increased sweat rate, uh, which increases the risk of dehydration and cramps. You're losing a lot of liquid and you're also losing a lot of electrolytes in that sweat. And we see that this can increase from about 300 milliliters an hour in normal conditions to up to 3.5 liters per hour in some of our rowers that we've measured. So these are huge sweat rates and it's a huge amount of fluid and salts that need to be replaced. Uh, Kay is probably going to come back a little bit to the kind of nutrition and hydration part. Uh, we also see that the increased body temperature impairs enzyme function. So all of our processes, all of our cells in our body are made to operate optimally at around 37 degrees. As soon as your body temperature starts to rise, all of these processes will go slower. So muscle function will be reduced. And in addition, we see quite a big influence on cognitive function. So it's maybe not quite as uh, critical for rowing, but in kind of team sports where there's a lot of tactical and technical decisions to be made, we see that there's a big impairment in kind of focus and decision-making ability. So I won't go into this in too much detail, but this is just to show that almost all functions in the body are influenced by body temperature. And when that body temperature becomes too high, all of these processes are impaired. So we've done quite a lot of work with uh, almost all of our endurance sports that are going to be in Tokyo. Uh, one of the things we've done is we've measured core temperature changes in our athletes uh, during the test events in Tokyo. We've done this with uh, with triathlon, we've also done it with kind of sand volleyball and sailing and some of the other non-endurance sports. And we see that in the long endurance events, we see extreme increases in core temperature. So we see at the finish line, these athletes are up in 40 to 41 degrees Celsius. So 40 degrees is what is an, 
regarded as an extremely high fever in medical terms. So these are definitely not core body temperatures that are positive for exercise performance. And we also see that they're actually at these temperatures for a long time. So these athletes, um, these triathletes had 40 minutes or above at 40 degrees Celsius. And what we see is that this, is, this means that there's a significant risk of heat illness if your athletes are not acclimated. It's obviously a lot lower in rowing than it would be in, for example, cycling or triathlon because your competition time is so much shorter. But you're still going to have athletes who are out there warming up and are exposed to the heat and the humidity and the sun for quite a prolonged period of time. And what is important is that if you acclimate your athletes, you get something that's called acquired thermal tolerance. That means that they're actually better able to tolerate that kind of core temperature in addition to the fact that their body is better able to dissipate heat so that they actually get hotter slower. And the interesting thing is that we knew that this was going to be a really big challenge for, for example, triathlon and cycling, who are competing over a long time. But we saw that even in sand volleyball and sailing and a lot of other sports where the athletes, for one, are used to competing in hot environments. And before they went to Tokyo, they said that they, will, they didn't think that they would have a problem with the heat. And we see that a lot of those athletes, well, all of those athletes really struggled. So even our volleyball players who... They compete in Australia, they compete in Brazil, they compete in lots of hot places, and they do that several times during the season. They found the humidity in Tokyo really, really challenging. Um, so this is just a graph to show. We had one athlete compete a, a kind of a test event, triathlon, uh, in exactly the same conditions. And what you see here is actually the, the warm-up and the starting temperature is, is critical here. If you manage to reduce the core temperature increase during the warm-up, this will carry through the whole race. So it is at least worth thinking about when you have athletes competing in the heat that maybe cutting down on the warm-up, both in terms of duration and intensity, m might be a good idea. Because if you start with a core temperature that's already high, you've got less to go on during the race. So we know that heat acclimation, in terms of improving performance in the heat and reducing the risk of heat illness, uh, heat acclimation is the most important thing. And typically, there's, there's a, like you saw with the individual variation in terms of how much performance is reduced, there's also a big individual difference in how quickly people acclimate to heat. So it varies, but typically, 10 to 14 days, you'll have an athlete that is fully acclimatized. Um, we started with rowing uh, before the World Championships in Sarasota. That was the first time we did anything to do with heat with the, the rowers. Uh, and around that time, there was also some research that came out about uh, hot water immersion for heat acclimation. Uh, and there was a research group, I think, in, um, in Wales that had done some work showing that if you actually have athletes sitting in a hot bath, they get much of the same heat acclimation that you do if you train or live in that kind of environment. So we wanted to test this out with our, our rowers. Uh, it seemed like a really attractive strategy because it doesn't influence the training. You can do it kind of, you can do all your training in cool temperate conditions and then you can just get them to sit in a bath afterwards and hopefully get the same uh, heat acclimation effect. So before the, the World Championships, we divided our rowers into two groups. One group did uh, the hot water immersion and the second group did a kind of a traditional heat acclimation protocol where they completed training sessions in the heat. Uh, and these bars, the red bars are before the acclimation period and the blue bars are after the acclimation period. And we see that there's actually quite a big improvement in performance in terms of heart rate. This is at the same workload. So after acclimation, both with the hot water immersion and the heat training, heart rate is much lower at the same workload. But when we look at blood lactate and perceived exertion, the heat training actually was a lot more effective than the hot water immersion. And the other thing was that the hot water immersion was actually a lot more stressful and tiring for the athletes than we had perhaps imagined. We had thought that this would be kind of free acclimation, that it wouldn't influence the quality of their training, but actually they found that at least as tiring as doing the training sessions in the heat. So after doing this, we've pretty much concluded that Training in the heat is in better than hot water immersion. Hot water immersion, you get some adaptation, but it's, it's not as good as doing training sessions in the heat. 
So the following year, before the World Championships in Plovdin, we did use a similar protocol. Um, not really because it was the weather forecast wasn't certain that it would be very hot in Plovdin, but the rowers had experienced that they they thought that their shape and their form in Sarasota was was really good, and that the heat training had actually had a positive training effect as well as the acclimation effect. So because this is a period when the, the athletes need to be on water and it's not really practical to be doing a lot of ergometer sessions uh, in our environmental chamber, uh, we set up a basically what is a, a greenhouse tent uh, at Orungen, at the rowing stadium, so they could do their rowing sessions out on the water and then they can come in afterwards and sit on the, on the bikes in the tent and uh, do kind of a washout period where they also get the, the heat stimulus. And the feeling that the rowers got that this was actually beneficial for their performance is supported by a, a small amount of research that's been done on this recently, which shows that actually training in the heat, it provides a, a kind of a unique stimulus for the cardiovascular system and can actually have somewhat of a similar effect to altitude training in terms of the blood response and the response of the aerobic system. So you can get an additional training, session, uh, a training effect from completing, completing sessions in the heat than you would if you just did those sessions in kind of a normal environment. Um, I'm just going to talk briefly about uh, a few kind of special, uh, some populations where you might have to think a little bit differently. So this is a core temperature graph for one of our lightweight rowers. Uh, before competition, they go through some quite uh, challenging weigh-in procedures where they, they sweat a lot and they obviously get their their core temperature increase already before they start their race. So this is a, a lightweight rower. When he started his kind of weigh-in routines, he, his core temperature increases here. He weighs in here, and he starts his race here. And what we see is that the dehydration that's caused by his weigh-in procedure, even though he's rehydrating between the races, he gets actually quite an, a surprisingly steep increase in core temperature when he then starts to warm up and when he rows his race. So this wasn't a competition in the heat, this was just in normal conditions, but it's at least worth bearing in mind that if you have lightweight rowers who are going through this kind of routine in Tokyo, they might have an impaired capacity to dissipate heat after their weigh-in routine. So they might be more susceptible to heat stroke and to a performance decrement. And we see that dehydration, that's one of the factors that increases the risk of heat stroke. Uh, we also have certain medications that influence uh, the body's ability to thermoregulate. And we also see the infections and sunburn. So if your athlete is sunburned uh, or has a cold, it will change the body's temperature set point, so where it tries to regulate temperature, which means that as soon as your athlete is either sunburned or has an infection, they are at a greater risk of heat stroke than if they didn't. And we also see that in certain para populations, so particularly those with spinal cord injury, there's also a very reduced capacity to control um, body temperature. So almost all of the, the mechanisms that your body uses to cool down are controlled by the central nervous system. And these will not function optimally below the kind of the level of the injury. So if you have an athlete with, particularly with a high spinal cord injury, we see quite exponential increases in core body temperature and also a reduced thermal perception. So they don't feel as hot, but their core temperature rises really, really quickly and in a very uncontrolled way. So they are certainly at a, an increased risk of heat stroke, and they also appear to have an even larger performance decrement than, um, than non-spinal cord injured athletes. What we do see is that when we've done the limited data we have on spinal cord injured athletes is that they actually respond really well to the heat training, at least when you have a low spinal cord injury. So doing a heat acclimation with them is, is at least as important, if not more important, than with your uh, able-bodied athletes. There was a question, I won't go into this in too much detail, but there was a question earlier about uh, how you would combine, if you have an athlete going to altitude in the phase before the Olympics, how you would then structure that in terms of the heat acclimation. This isn't as relevant for you guys, because I think most of you will come down from altitude in good time before traveling to Tokyo, but for some of our athletes, we have teams that want to come directly from altitude and go straight to Tokyo. Uh, and we've done a lot of tests in, in terms of combining heat acclimation and altitude. And we were worried that maybe the physiological stress of the heat combined with the altitude exposure would be so high that it would be too much. But actually, we saw that when we did this with our triathletes, when they had a heat chamber set up at altitude, they 
had a really, actually an augmented and increased hemoglobin mass response and came out of that altitude training camp really well. So if you did want to do it, it is fully possible to combine the two, uh, but you have to be quite careful so that the, the total load doesn't become too uh, large. So we use our uh, environmental chamber in Norway uh, for a number of different things. We do it to perform heat acclimation so, and to find the kind of the optimum protocol for different athletes. Like I said, different athletes take longer or less time to, um, to acclimate to the heat. So we, we've spent quite a lot of time testing our, our individual athletes so that we can make protocols that fit for each individual. Um, we've also test, tested the efficacy of different cooling strategies. It's interesting to test that in a really controlled environment and then there's also obviously limitations in terms of the competition day and the setting and the rules of, of the, in the different sports of what is actually possible to, to do. Um, we measure sweat rates and tailor hydration plans. Like I mentioned, that some of our athletes have extremely high sweat rates in the heat. So, uh, and when um, gastrointest gastrointestinal function is reduced at heat, in the heat as well, it means that you have an athlete that needs to drink a lot but maybe tolerates less than what they would when it's cooler. So we have some challenges there that we work closely with our nutrition department to try and make tailored protocols for each athlete. We also test different warm-up strategies. So we've done this with a few rowers and a few other athletes to look at how we can get the athlete optimally prepared so that they are ready to go when, they, when they're on that start line, but that we don't get too large core temperature increases because what we don't want is a, an athlete that's too hot to perform optimally or already before they've started the race. So we've, uh, we've done that quite a lot of that. And then we also practice mental strategies for maintaining focus and preserving technique in the heat. So to summarize, um, we know that high ambient temperature and humidity have a significant negative effect on performance. The magnitude of this effect is dependent on the duration that you're actually exercising. So the longer you're doing it and the higher intensity, the quicker you will get to a core temperature that is negative for performance. There are very large individual differences in heat tolerance. Um, these are influenced by a number of factors. A lot of it's genetic, you can't really do anything about it. And there's also differences in training status and medical conditions. So actually, a lot of athletes are partially heat acclimated already because every day they're training and they're increasing their core temperatures just through the general training they're doing. So typically athletes will be slightly better at tolerating the heat than um, non-athletes. And heat acclimation is is certainly the most effective way to, uh, to optimize performance and to reduce the risk of heat illness. We've at least found that doing training sessions in the heat is the most effective. Uh, hot water immersion can induce some adaptation, but it's not as good. We see that complete heat acclimation is typically achieved after 10 to 14 days, but the curve is it's very steep in the start and then it kind of flattens out. So the first three to five days, you actually see a lot of the physiological adaptations are happening. So if you don't have time to do a 10 or 14 days heat acclimation, you can actually get quite a good effect just through three or four or five sessions. Uh, most physiological adaptations are maintained for at least a week. Uh, you can also, depending on kind of the, the competition plan and the travel schedule that your athlete has, you can structure the heat acclimation a little bit differently. So you could do a kind of a a two-week bulk a little bit earlier and then you could have a few sessions every few days to try and maintain that. So there's a, quite a few different ways you can structure it depending on what fits for your athlete. And as I mentioned, some of the adaptations that you get from training in the heat actually appear also to be beneficial for performance in temperate conditions. So it's, it would likely never be negative to do a heat acclimation. So if you're unsure whether the competition is going to be, whether the forecast is going to be hot or not, then I would always do it and even if it's not hot you might actually get some some benefits from it thank you So first of all, thanks a lot to Ida for the excellent first talk. Um, so um, even if we applied chronic strategies like heat acclimatization or acclimation, there's still something we, we could do if it comes to racing and that will be cooling, the athlete cooling uh, the body. 
So my, the purpose of my talk wouldn't be to tell you what you have to do, but my purpose would be to give you an overview what you could do and what you should think about when you're doing it. So as Ida said, uh, the combination of the high temperatures and also the high humidity will challenging our athletes, especially as the ability to lose the heat by sweat evaporation would be decreased by the high humidity. So when we look from a physiology perspective to uh, heat stress, we would take a look at body core temperatures and also the skin temperatures. And the increase in the body core temperature was shown to be the main effect when it comes to a reduction in endurance performance. So a good starting point would be to take a look what would happen with the core temperature of a rower when he's exercising. Therefore, you could use a mathematic model. In this case, it includes 21 different factors. And we do this calculation for a typical heavy rate rower. So 1.95 meters of height, so 95 kilos. So the athlete was already 12 days uh, under heat exposure and we assumed uh, temperatures which would be likely for Tokyo, so 29 degrees Celsius and a relative humidity of 80% and some wind. So let's take a look what would happen if the rower do a classical rowing session, which means that we have a total uh, load, uh, meaning the load by heat and the load by mechanical workout of uh, 350 watts. So what we would see at the beginning, nothing much would happen to the body core temperature. And after about 10 minutes, the body core temperature starts to increasing. And after 60 minutes, uh, the body core temperature would reach a critical uh, value, which might be between so 90 and 40, uh, 39 and 40 degrees. But it's quite important that each individual is quite different, and some athlete might might be able to uh, manage uh, body core temperatures up to 40 degrees. Other ones would be uh, hardly struggling already at 39 degrees. So. The message is, if we do long duration rowing, it, might be, it would be a problem uh, by the core temperature, but if it comes to racing, if we assume that, uh, that we uh, start to race with normal body temperature, uh, which would be 37 degrees, so we would see that uh, the body core temperature would increase sharply, but it wouldn't reach these high regions because of the, uh, of the duration of the rowing race, race, which is seven minutes. So even if we start with a higher body temperature of uh, 38 degrees, the athlete might be reached this critical error, but uh, it wouldn't be at 40 degrees, but it would be start to being a problem. So that's just the model. So let's look what uh, real data would show us. And there are some data from the Aussies. Uh, they uh, studied the effect of uh, rate reduction, light rates, but also the effect of uh, hot humidities. So what they are basically done, they perform a 2K race under normal conditions and a 2K race under hot conditions. And hot conditions were about uh, 32 degrees and 61 uh, percentage of humidity. And if we focus on the first uh, bars. So we, we could see that during some exercise and some maximal intensities, body temperature would be increased, but not in the critical region. But if we do uh, the 2000 meter race, we would see that under hot conditions, body core temperature would be much higher than compared to the normal conditions. But again, and no one of this athlete which were tested reached this critical zone. So we could uh, say that pre-cooling would be uh, a necessary thing for roaring. So pair cooling, so during the race might be not that beneficial or not that worthwhile. And, per and cooling after the race would be also important. So let's see what looks with the, um, with the performance of the rowers. We could clearly see that in hot conditions, they perform uh, slower by about uh, five seconds. 
and even after a second uh, session under hot conditions, which was performed uh, 48 hours later or 96 hours, we could see that the negative effect was decreasing, but still these hot conditions decrease our ability to grow fast. So how to monitor heat stress or uh, a scientific perspective would be to simply use a thermal pill. So as it was done here uh, during the World Championships in cycling in Doha, uh, that's a quite nice uh, possibility to monitor what is happening to the body core temperature. But a much more practical one, which I was used this year with the junior team and also the under 23 team, I simply use a scale for the thermal perception and uh, uh, thermal um, tolerance, which was quite nice, uh, firstly, to uh, monitor the, um, um, the way the heat acclimatization was done, and also it was quite effective to identify athletes who might struggling with the heat. So let's come to cooling strategies and cooling methods. So the main goal of cooling the body would be um, to decrease the negative effects of heat on the own performance. And also quite important factor is we try to decrease the negative effect on the thermal uh, comfort of our athletes. So you could distinguish between external and internal uh, cooling methods. So external cooling means that you apply something from the outside of the body. So cooling from the outside to the inside. So uh, classical stuff would be simply going to a room which would be cool and using air conditioning, but also cold showers and cold water immersion and also the most regular stuff which we would see at, at every gutter track, so using ice towels or ice vests. So internal um, methods are cooling the body from inside out. So you, you just uh, injected a, a cold a drink or ice to the body, and this will cooling uh, the inner organs and also the circulating blood. So also quite important is when we talk about cooling is when we did apply it, so pre, per, or post, and also the duration we would apply it to the athlete. So the effects of cooling um, techniques are quite different, so depending on the cooling power and also on the comfort of the of the athlete, so but basically we try to increase the heat storage capacity of our rower and also increase uh, the amount of heat the rower could lose and we try to reduce the thermal strain and also the cardiovascular strain. Um, so actually there are a lot of research showing positive effects uh, of cooling to uh, endurance events of longer durations, but there are less uh, studies uh, try to figure out the effect on, on rowing performance, so middle-long distances, and also there are not that much studies on real-life situations. So most of the studies are done in the lab, so which can't be transferred 100% to uh, the rowing track. So let's talk about pre-cooling. So what we could do, the first idea would be, or the first uh, situation would be, that we try to stay as long as possible in a cool air conditioning um, environment. So the team tents in Tokyo might be a problem, so it would be challenging to keep them cool, but uh, there are a lot of facilities would provided for the athlete to stay cool. So the main goal of pre-cooling would be to keep a normal core temperature, uh, to keep the athletes cool, and also with a nice uh, thermal uh, sensation. So what you could use and what was shown to be very effective is using ice slurries, uh, which might, should be uh, taken about 30 minutes before the competition. So the amount normally ranges by 7.5 grams per kilogram body mass, which is huge, so meaning volumes of 500 to 700 milliliters, so that's quite huge. And, uh, but um, there are quite nice data showing that this would be quite effective, 
and also Tony Weiss presented last year in Berlin some data showing quite meaningful positive effects of using ice slurries prior to a roaring race. Um, but there are also side effects of the ice slurries. First of all, you have to uh, swallow all uh, these huge amounts of ice, so which could cause some which is called uh, brain freezing, and it also could cause gastrointestinal problems. Uh, yes, and also a good uh, opportunity might be to use cold showers, so also cold water immersion, uh, before going to the warm-up. So, uh, the challenge uh, of cooling strategies during warm-up is that we don't want to negatively impact uh, the goals of warming up, so meaning we have to heat the body a little bit up, so for uh, increased oxygen, uh, kinetics, and also better muscle fiber recruitment, and most importantly, the mental um, preparation of the athlete. So, but the goal would be to lowering the increase in the body temperature, so meaning that we don't want to that the athlete start uh, the race with a too high body temperature, so try to warm up, take all the positive effects of warm up, but try to decrease the increase of the body temperature. So therefore, what it's done, usually have to uh, warm up in a cold environment, so it doesn't make sense to go up for a row 45 minutes before the race. So that would uh, be lead to increased body cold temperature. So instead, you would go uh, on the ERG in an air conditioning room. And also a good uh, thing is to wearing a cooling rest. And they're also for rowing quite a lot of research showing positive effects of wearing a cooling vest during the warm-up, so which would be ranging between 1.1 and uh, 3.9 increase in rowing performance uh, compared to not doing it. So what would be a worthwhile uh, effect in rowing? So we could assume that between uh, 1.0, uh, sorry, between uh, 0 0.3 uh, uh, percentage increase in the time in the final times would be a positive effect in winning medals, and it would be translate to approximately one percentage improvements in the power output during a race. So wearing a cooling rest is a great uh, possibility to improve your performance in hot and humid conditions. So when it comes to the race, we can't do that much. So what we see at the starts is often that uh, athletes using cold showers by water to cool them down. And of course, it would be quite important to wearing uh, some clothing which would allow to losing um, the heat. So what we try to improve the heat loss during the race so um, I think it's allowed by FISA to wear a cooling vest during the race and also a cap and all the staff stuff. But it's quite questionable if it would be beneficial because as we see in the first graphs at the beginning of this presentation, uh, increase in body core temperatures during the race wouldn't be a major issue. So what we could do after post-cooling, so the most important thing is to normalize the body core temperature and the method that was shown to be most effective would be in cold water emission. So the athlete will go for 10 to 25 minutes to an ice pool with temperatures between 12 and 15 Celsius. And also quite important is that always ask the athletes how they are feeling. So some athlete might say after 10 minutes it's enough, I'm freezing, then they have to go out. Someone will stay after a half hour inside. So it's quite depending on the rower. So, um, so in, especially in Tokyo, it might be a problem. What you often see and regard us is so that the athlete will, will come to the port after the race, taking uh, a cooling vest and then going back to the water. That might be a problem in Tokyo, especially because it's quite cozy uh, at, at the finish there. Um, and also what the feed are thinking about is providing cold showers um, at the boat uh, house so that the athlete come directly from the water taking a cold shower or go into um, the cold water emission bath, cooling down, and then it comes to the cool down, which is quite important. 
So again, it would be a bad idea to do the cool out outside, so go inside. So the facilities are quite well in Tokyo, so there would be a nice uh, erg room. So it's also positive, possible to wear a cooling vest during the cool down, so which would avoid that the body is heating up again, but allow to recover for a half hour or something like this. Also quite important is rehydration and reloading after the race directly. So now we go to, through the whole day of racing, so now it's up to you to decide which uh, method you would use. But it's quite important that uh, method and strategies uh, differ greatly by the cooling power, so also the athlete comfort. So the physical and also the performance effect will greatly um, uh, depend on the things and planning individualization and rehearsal is quite important, especially rehearsal, so the athlete might be aware of things which would happen to him. For example, if you're wearing a cooling vest during the warm-up, then throwing it apart, going underwater, uh, the change between feeling cool and well and feeling quite hot could be quite, uh, could be a cure, cure quite quickly, so the athlete has to be aware about it and know how to how to manage it. So as Ida said, so hydration and refueling is quite important uh, during hot and humid conditions, especially because the sweat rate is uh, quite hard and a good possibility uh, in terms of hydration is to measure this, the sweat rate. So it's quite simple, it's just do pre rate in before um, the exercise, then go exercising, do a post uh, rate substrate the stuff uh, by the things the athlete was drinking, then you could calculate roughly the amount of sweat you were losing, um, which could be uh, quite different depending on the, on the environmental conditions. Also, there's a quite variability between different athletes. So usually, if you be at the normal uh, conditions, here are data for 10 degrees, so it's quite cold. We have sweat rate during uh, rowing with amounts about one liter, and under hot conditions, so 33 degrees, it could be up to two liters. So, but again, the variability between the athletes are quite high, and that's why you should measure it. So, rehydration is quite complex. So, if we start with the simple intake of water, it's important to drink amounts ranging between one and 1.5 times the sweat volume you were losing. So directly after the race, you should uh, drink this amount. And during the race, uh, during the day in hot and humid conditions, it's assumed that it would be a fair amount between two and three milliliters per kilogram body mass. Drink this every two to three hours. That would be normally enough to be hydrated. So the next quite important part of rehydration is the absorption. So through the intestinal which is improved by the temperature of the fluid you're drinking. So normally about 10 to 12 degrees would be an optimal temperature. And also add some carbohydrates between 30 and 60 grams um, per liter you are drinking. Uh, that would be improve the absorption rate and it's also quite important for refueling because under hot and humid condition also um, the oxygenation of carbon carbon hydrates would be increased, so you have to add some in your nutrition. So next part would be the distribution of the fluid through the water. Therefore, you need uh, sodium. Sodium is quite important. You should uh, add about 0.5 to 0.7 grams per liter of fluid intake to make sure that the water you're drinking also could be distributed through the water and reach the cells and also the blood. So, but there are also quite huge differences between different persons. So, if we talk about uh, salty sweeters, they could be amounts of 1.5 grams of sodium you should add. Uh, so, the last point would be the reintention of the fluids uh, by the kidneys and also the the urination rate. So the goal must be to drink enough, but also keep it in the, in the body. And therefore the timing is quite important. So it doesn't make sense to drink uh, 
uh, 1.5 times the sweating rate in 20 minutes. So that would lead that you go to the toilet after 20 minutes and leave all the stuff you're drinking there. So it's quite important to drink this volume uh, during a period of 60 to 90 minutes and also sodium would improve the rate you could hold uh, the water in the body. So what would be the take home measured? So clearly as also indicated by either heat stress impairs the performance and in serious cases also the health of our athletes. So it should be managed and also monitored. So cooling strategies, as I shown, are likely to improve rowing performance. So the effects might be varying greatly. So also here planning, visualization, and rehearsal are quite important. And uh, special environments also need special needs for hydration and refueling. So the key points are start hydrated and rehydrate uh, aggressively after the race and after the training session and also again planning, visualization, and rehearsal are quite important. So, and last but not least, uh, the main message would be prepare for the worst, but hope for the best. So, thanks a lot. Thank you very much, uh, Ida and Kay. Have you some questions? Can you tell us something about iron and the uh, hot temperature? There is an influence. We have a lack of iron when the temperature is too high. You're asking me or her? Yeah, both of you. Both of you. I think you have an opinion. There is a lack of iron if the temperature is very high. The atlas, they lose iron or not? Iron. Iron. F A. <laughs> Yeah, ferritin, yeah, in the blood. I don't know about the um, I'm not a nutritionist, but I, as far as I know, I don't know of the influence of heat on iron status. Um, as I mentioned, there has been some research that shows that actually training in the heat, you can get an increase in hemoglobin mass and red blood cell volume, so you would obviously need to have a sufficient iron status to be able to create those new red blood cells, but as far as I'm aware, um, Kay can correct me if he knows better, but I don't know that heat influences iron status. I've, I've never read anything that says that you're more likely to have anemia or a, a lack of iron when you're in the heat, but I might be wrong. Like I said, I'm not a nutritionist. Hi, thank you for a great presentation. I was just going to ask if there's a difference between men and women physiologically in the cooling sort of capacity. I know in the offices they tune temperatures differently for, uh, they're mainly tuned for men. So I was <laughs> wondering if, if we've seen the effect. I, I think there's probably the biggest effects are in terms of kind of uh, body composition. So if you have a lot of the increase in core temperature is both dependent on the ambient conditions, so how hot it is outside, but also on the workload. So the more absolute power you're creating, the more temperature or heat you're creating in your body. So in that way, we see kind of often larger core temperature increases in males because they're doing a larger amount of work. However, there's also differences in terms of fat mass. That obviously isn't really an issue for, um, for athletes. And then there's also hormonal changes in terms of where you are in your cycle. As a, as a woman, you probably all the women here will know that your, core your body operates at a slightly different temperature at different points in your cycle. Uh, I'm not sure if there's been done any research on athletes in terms of how that impacts heat acclimation, but I would certainly think that it would a little bit because your resting temperature is a little bit different at different times in your cycle. But like I said, the, the amount of absolute power that you're creating in the work you're doing is, is very relevant in terms of the core temperature increase you're seeing. So we actually often see bigger increases in the males. Okay. 
No more questions? So thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you. I'd like to introduce uh, Mike Purser from Canada. Uh, Mike has done a lot of work in recent years um, using uh, various programs to um, look at blade slip and the impact on rigging, or how rigging has an impact on blade slip and how this has an impact on your speed. So I'm going to ask Mike to present on boat slip and speed. Test. Oh, you guys are great. This works. Got the buttons, there's the dot. Okay, so I have two, uh, it's a two-part presentation, uh, blade slip and also uh, boat speed video analysis. And uh, what we'll do is we'll start with the, um, the boat speed video analysis. Uh, I'll just show you how this data is captured and then uh, a little bit about how we uh, look at analyzing the data We'll look at the curve and curve geometry, how we can look at uh, analyze curve geometry mathematically. And then I'll show you a couple examples of uh, just how we can look at a curve and see, really see very easily opportunities to improve speed. The second part will be the blade slip. Uh, what is it? Um, positive and negative blade slip and um, a comparative analysis study that I've been working on over four years. So um, this is the equipment I use to capture the blade slip. Simple camera, video camera, and uh, the video analysis software. I use a, a software called Dartfish, but there's other software out there that will, uh, will, will uh, capture the, um, the information off the video that we need to capture. So this is me, the last four years at the World Championships. This is you guys up here riding by, yelling and screaming, just as I'm trying to video the crews going by. And um, this is how the, the uh, camera is set up. So I set up in the, uh, usually between the 1200 and the 1250 meter mark, and I have my camera shooting perpendicular across the race course. Um, with a um, video frame rate about 60 frames per second. And it kept, like I say, the camera is on a stationary tripod. Um, this is the example I'll just show you today. This is, uh, um, this is the um, German 8 uh, from 2019 in Linz. And after we've captured the data, we bring it into the uh, video analysis software. First thing I do is I zoom in to the, um, to the video and I put the boat in the middle of the screen. And then I'll draw a line, the length of the boat from the bow to the stern, and I can zoom in and get it right on the bow and right on the stern. And I designate that line um, the length of the boat, which allows us, which allows the video uh, software to capture distances based on the depth of uh, the depth of the boat is from the uh, from the camera. The next thing I'll do is I'll put a tracking marker on the bow ball, or on the bow marker. And uh, this tracking node, tracking node will, will uh, track with the, um, with the video. I often like to use the front edge of the, video, of the bow marker because the tracking node is going to follow the colors. It'll take the, it'll capture the color pixels and it will move every time the color pixels are being, are moving. Uh, the next thing I'll do is I'll input a, um, a data table into the, uh, onto the um, uh, um, video. The data table will uh, collect time data 
it'll collect distance data, and it will calculate and collect the speed data. And I'll just show you how that works. This is, uh, this is a table here, capturing the data as the, uh, as the tracking node tracks with the bow marker across the screen. And here's a little bit uh, simpler look at it. The uh, software knows the uh, distance from that tracking node to the left, um, left edge of the video frame. The video zoomed in here a little bit, but in this video, the, uh, the bow marker, sorry, in the tracking node is 13.08 uh, meters from the edge of the frame. And the time for this frame is 1.101 seconds. In the next frame, the boat has moved about 12 centimeters to 13.20093 uh, centimeters from the edge of the screen. And now the time of this frame is 1.117. With 60 frames per uh, second, it's, um, each frame is about 1.016 of a second. Uh, the data can be ex um, extracted from the, from the data table into a, a spreadsheet. And this is the data we have. In the column A, we have the um, time, which is the time on the video. Column B is the distance. The distance, the, the tracking node is from the edge of the screen. And column C is the, um, the speed that's been calculated within the software. Uh, so each line on this uh, table represents one frame in the video. And once you, once you have a table in, in, a, in a program like Excel or a spreadsheet program, you can easily transfer that information into a line graph. Um, and so we, here we, we're um, graphing speed against time, speed being on the left, uh, uh, left uh, y-axis. And this is uh, a... Uh, a speed curve for the uh, German men's eight last, uh, last year. We, uh, we can also calculate acceleration, and this is probably more common for people to see. Acceleration being the change in, um, change in speed divided by the change in time. Um, the acceleration here is on the right uh, axis. Zero acceleration or constant speed being the uh, green dashed line across the middle of the, um, of the graph. The other thing we want to do, I always used to see these and I used to say, oh, I wish I knew exactly where the catch was and exactly where the finish was because that would help me as a coach. And uh, so using video though, it's very easy to go and uh, identify in time the positions of the stroke. And so what I do is, uh, point one is the position of full reach. And we can go back and forth on the video frame by frame until we see that athlete at full reach. And say, okay, this stroke is starting to move back in this frame, so I'm going to go back and mark that time and record that time. We record the time of the full catch when the blade is fully buried. Then when the blade is, the oar is perpendicular to the boat, when the blade is furthest to the stern, I call that the finish. We uh, record the feather, and then to get a full stroke cycle, we record uh, full reach to and catch to. So we have a full stroke cycle just for one stroke, though. So here we have the uh, here we have our speed graph and our acceleration graph, and now we can overlay the technique points that we've just recorded those times for. So we have this integrated graph of speed and technique. Wow. And then, so, what I thought is that we could look at this mathematically and analyze it and really break it down to analyze time, analyze speed, analyze acceleration, analyze movement, decrease in speed or increase in speed. And we could really get a lot of um, information uh, from the speed curve. I have uh, identified a number of uh, factors then from all those mathematical uh, options. Um, and there's more than this, but here's just a few. So I call these technique factors. And we can 
analyze the, the number, uh, for example, in uh, drive, drive acceleration. How much does a boat accelerate between the catch and the finish? And these are the, uh, the technique factors. Um, and, and so when we have these technique factors, what we can do is look at our crew's development over time. Or if we do it one um, a month, if we, if we graph them a month later, where have they improved? Or we can do it, uh, we can look at the, uh, the technique factors and uh, compare that against other crews. Well, let's just look at this. This, uh, this is uh, an athlete from the 2017 World Championships. Nice curve. 2018 World Championships, real improvement, real improvement through the uh, uh, drive portion, much more acceleration. Comes to a, a higher speed. And uh, in 2018, a nice improvement with, at the catch right after the finish. So we can look at athletes year after year or their improvement over time. This, these are the numbers, the analysis numbers that go with those years. Uh, and we looked at drive acceleration. I talked about drive acceleration briefly. Uh, in um, 2017, the acceleration was 1.73. 2018, 1.91. And 2019 was uh, 2.10. Uh, we can look at um, recovery acceleration. We can look at all these factors here. The recovery acceleration. Oh, wrong button. We, the uh, recovery acceleration also improves. 1.31, 1. Point, uh, sorry, 1.13, 1.19, 1.22. 1 so there's improvement in that area as well. Um, we can also look at the athlete's analysis compared to the other 12 boats in the A and B final. So the red, the red numbers up here represent the average of everybody in the A and B final in this boat category. And the black numbers are the numbers we just looked at from, this is 2017, uh, drive acceleration. There's the other years that uh, we can see how this athlete compared to, to the other crews for all those years. Um, what the goal was, one of the goals was to uh, sort of try and figure out, um, and, uh, and I should have mentioned it before when I looked at that, the, uh, the curve with all the um, mathematical formulas, I thought at one time, about three or four years ago, I could figure out the ideal stroke. I could find the ideal curve, the ideal curve. Well, I haven't found it yet. But there's still factors that we're looking at. Uh, here is the uh, uh, drive acceleration, change in speed divided by change in time, acceleration. Um, this is the data we have from the last three years in uh, men's single, women's single, uh, men's and women's pairs as well. The bottom corner here in the right of the table is a little table that shows the averages for um, drive acceleration for those four boat classes. Uh, then the, uh, the next thing I did, next thing I wanted to do is try and figure out whether this um, factor was related to performance. So we correlated all the, uh, the men's singles and there's not a lot of data. I'm, I don't have a lot of data. Um, but this is where I'm going. I correlated, this is the average of the men's singles. The first, the, uh, first second, and third place finish, uh, this is the average uh, 3.1 um, acceleration. Uh, and so you can see the lines that represent the, uh, the uh, acceleration against or against the performance. First place through 12th place. I'm trying to correlate and figure out whether this is a performance factor. Does this factor relate to performance? And so far, the red dashed line, which is an average of all the boats, uh, is not suggesting that this is a performance factor. Um, the other thing I do, and this is very powerful for coaches and athletes, is um, we just looked at the graph. This is one of my lightweight athletes from a few years ago. Um, looked at the graph, 
And we saw this real speed wobble just after the catch. The boat just loses speed right here. Here's the green line, here's the catch. It starts to accelerate and then it, it loses speed, boat loses speed and then accelerates again. Um, and what, what we can do is go back and line up the time, which is just after the catch, and we line up the, um, the time on the video. And we can go frame by frame, forwards and backwards, and see exactly what that athlete is doing. What's happening to cause that loss in speed? And it, like I say, it's very powerful. When you see athletes and you show them a curve, this is your curve. Look at, you lost all this speed right here. They are so focused on, and anytime you show technology to athletes, I think they're very interested in it. But it's a, uh, as I said, it's a powerful motivating tool to the next time you offer suggestions on not lifting the shoulders or not bearing the blade too deep, uh, they're much more responsive because they've seen, physically seen that loss in speed that they've had. Uh, I wanna highlight this, Conovia software. This is free software. You can download this free off the internet and it does all the stuff that Dartfish does. Um, and so I wanted to use that. I have it, but I don't use it that often. I want to put it here. Uh, here's another example of just identifying opportunities for speed. Uh, this athlete, if you put your mouse, put your mouse right over top of the curve here coming into the finish, the purple line is when the blade is perpendicular. The red line is the finish, just at the finish. You can see halfway between, put your mouse right on that point on the line and it'll tell you at nine, 0.3 seconds within in that video because that curve was taken from that video so 9.39 seconds in that video the boat starts to slow down or loses acceleration certainly loses acceleration again we go back to 9.39 seconds on the video and we can show the athlete frame by frame what she's doing and what we need to correct to keep that acceleration going in the last part of the stroke. So again, really powerful tool. Athletes love to see it. They like to see their curves. They like that feedback, that visual feedback. So it's only one stroke and this is a big problem. Um, because it's, this is, okay, I've got, what I've got, I'm gonna show you here is four different curves. Same crew in uh, two curves from the semifinal, two, two curves from the final. Here's the first curve. Uh, this is the second curve. And you can see, second curve, the uh, boat speed at the catch dipped a lot lower. And, the, and at the finish, uh, the first curve is not as smooth out of the finish. So there's all these differences each stroke. Uh, the next curve is from the final. Now, I've adjusted this curve in speed because I think this I think the final was slower than the uh, semifinal. So but I've adjusted this curve and moved it up so that the speed, the average speed for this curve matches the speed, the average speed from the two final curves average, uh, match the average speed from the, the semifinals. Uh, that's the first, uh, that's the first uh, curve. You can see here on this one, uh, on this one had a little higher peak speed uh, on the recovery. And here again is the very next stroke on the final, as it's going, as the crew is just passing me. I was at the 1,200 meter mark in Linz, uh, and you can see, well, they miss they miss the catch a little bit on this one. So there's inconsistencies. There's inconsistencies in rowing technique. There's inconsistencies in capturing the data with the measuring points, uh, and we'll just talk about those. So the takeaways for the the boat speed sort of uh, analysis are this. It can be very inexpensive. The uh, camera can cost you less than uh, 500 bucks. Oh, here, it's a little more expensive. In Canada, it's less than 500 bucks, maybe less than a, a thousand pounds here, I'm not sure. Um, it's non-invasive. You can, you can video crew in practice, they don't even know. You can video the races going by, and I've been videotaping races at the World Championships for the last four years. So it's non-invasive. It provides objective, quantitative, and 
visual feedback, linking technique and speed. A direct link between technique and speed, which is, again, I, I'm going to say is really powerful for coaches and athletes. On the downside, it is only one stroke uh, and can be misleading with good or bad strokes. I'd personally like just to videotape bad strokes because I don't care about the good ones. I correct the bad ones, the good ones can take care of themselves. Uh, there's measurement errors. Measurement errors in the uh, uh, video. There's uh, what they call a parallax error. If you're uh, familiar with photography, the further you get away from the center of the frame, the more distorted the, uh, the measurement. And that's why we try and measure right in the center of the frame uh, and capture movement in the center of the frame as much as we can. But it's not 100% it's not accurate. Uh, um, so there are those inaccuracies. And finally, it, it, re it does require support uh, technical pr uh, people. I've shown coaches how to do this a number of times. They don't have time. You don't have time. You need uh, a technical support person uh, to, to capture the video and do the analysis. Uh, it takes me, um, not including the download, but probably 20 minutes to half an hour to analyze a crew and uh, go back and, and extract all that data and, and develop the curve. We can also capture rigging analysis uh, efficiency. Uh, I like to call it efficiency, or rigging analysis data. And we look at these six uh, points in uh, rigging analysis, drive time, blade slip, effective stroke length, how far are you moving the boat during the uh, stroke, stroke position, stroke rate, and stroke ratio. And I, uh, I analyze, for the coach that I'm working with, I do the analysis and say, here, we need to change your rigging this way based on these, uh, based on these numbers. Uh, and this is, but this is my segue, that's my segue into blade slip, because that's one of the factors that we analyze for uh, rigging. The blades, I think I'm doing okay. Um, so blade slip, we're going to look at it quickly. Uh, blade slip, what is it? Uh, positive and negative blade slip, and then we'll look at the data from the uh, study that I've been working on. So blade slip, blade slip is the distance that the tip of the blade moves in the water between the in the drive portion of the uh, stroke between the finish and catch, uh, and it's measured parallel to the boat. So we can have a look at it. This is just an example of how we're measuring it. We, uh, we draw a line where the tip of the blade enters the water. And we run the video through. And then we'll draw another line where the tip of the blade exits the water. And then we can measure between these two lines. Here we see, I think, 19, 19 uh, centimeters, 0.19 meters. This athlete has 0.19 meters of negative blade slip. The blade has moved through the water back towards the starting line, uh, 19 centimeters. Here's a positive blade slip, an example of positive blade slip. Again, we'll just, uh, we're videotaping when the boat's perpendicular to the boat. Boat goes in or blade goes in, we draw a line at the tip of the blade where it goes into the water. We'll draw another line on the tip of the blade when it comes out of the water. And here you can see that the blade is moved in the same direction as the boat. Uh, and we can see 25, 25 centimeters, 0.125 meters of positive blade slip. This slide just contrasts the two, right? Negative. Uh, negative blade slip and positive blade slip. But this is my favorite video. This is my favorite video. This is uh, Thomas Barrett 19, in 2017 uh, at the World Championships in um, Sarasota. And uh, bronze medalist. Oh, you guys don't know that though, right? Um, he has 0.67 meters of positive blade slip. He's moved his boat an extra two-thirds of a meter from the connecting in his blade. And I can tell you, uh, so the uh, effective stroke length is almost 3.5 meters in this particular frame. He's moved his boat almost 3.5 meters. The average right now, for the data I have over the last three years, 
2.77. Average men single moves their boat from when the tip of the blade goes in to when they're at the finish, 2.77 meters. Uh, so another three quarters of a, a meter ahead of average right here. Uh, I did this, started doing this rigging analysis in 2016 in uh, Rotterdam and uh, came back um, with a lot of video and um, um, one of the uh, master students at uh, Brock University, his name was uh, uh, Zach Lewis and he offered to help me do the analysis of all the, um, of all the data, we were just focus on rigging analysis at that time. And during uh, the, the uh, process, he suggested that we co-author a paper on, uh, uh, I think it was after we looked at the data, uh, he said, we, uh, we should write a paper on this. And so I said, that's great, Zach, you do the work. I'll, I'll let you know if, it's, if we're staying on track. Uh, but we did work on it together. And, and at that, it was called the, uh, the Comparative Analysis of Rigging Setup, setup Success no, set up and success among single scholars at the 2016 FISA World Championships of Rowing. And uh, since that time, uh, we've, we've um, collaborated and updated the uh, paper with uh, uh, data from 2017 and 2018. Um, let's just look at it. So this was the data I had from 2017. Uh, top finish position, first to 12th in, uh, at the World Championship, big World Championships in 2016. Uh, there were eight different boat classes. So the blue dot is the average blade slip for the first place crews at that regatta, in the single, in the single, men's or women's. And and they're all across, this, that's the average blade slip for the 12th place crews. And then we, I drew this simple line of best fit. And because again, we were looking to find out, is this a performance factor? If you have better blade slip, are you more likely to be successful? And in the end, in the paper we say, there's not enough data, but it appears that it could be. So, um, and, and uh, looking at the, the line of best fit, a simple line of best fit, um, it, it shows that probably at this end of the uh, finish positions, the, the blade slip is, uh, is better. Uh, so the following year, I was, I was in uh, Sarasota, captured the men's and women's data from the top 12 finish positions, added it to the uh, data again. Uh, did the same in Plovdiv, and uh, and again in uh, Linz last uh, summer. And so we looked at the. Um, this is the data that I have for this, and again, um, again I, I'm going to suggest that it's not enough data to confirm that this is a, a performance factor. What I'm suggesting is it might be but more data. And once the standard deviations close up a little bit, and I believe it will be, but right now um, it looks like it could be. And that's all I'm going to commit to. Um, so I wanted to put this up because this, is, uh, this shows you different boat classes. And different boat classes have different blade slips, average. Here in the bottom right corner of the graph, as we looked at the factors for uh, uh, drive acceleration. These are the uh, averages for blade slip of all the data. So 36 men singles. At, and this is just a men's single, women's single, men's pair, women's pair. This, this doesn't include the uh, 2016 data. Um, and so the average for women's pair, average blade slip for those 30, I think there's only 35, uh, um, the population's only 35 because there was one year there wasn't, somebody didn't race, but um, positive 0 0.05. So the average blade slip is positive 0.5 uh, centimeters. 
And it, it's, there's a range there, I didn't put the standard deviation, but men single, uh, positive, eight centimeters. So they're moving their blade, the average person moving their blade uh, in the positive direction by eight centimeters, average. Whereas the pairs, women's pair and men's pair both, the blade slip is negative over or less than uh, 30 centimeters. So the blade is really moving through the water as opposed to in a single where it's moving with the boat. Uh, and I did want to highlight that. Um, fours, uh, I know uh, if you have like 0.2, negative 0.2 and you're eight, you're doing well. Uh, negative 0.25 in a four, that's pretty good. That would be about average. Uh, but here I'm just showing you the, uh, the singles and the pairs. Uh, so I wanted to end, uh, uh, end this with um, just factors of blade slip. I, I think uh, we, all, we might all be able to guess at these or know these. Uh, rigging, big factor. The entry of the or entry angle or angle of entry at the catch where the blade's going in the water and what the, what the uh, catch angle is. Uh, the rigging, of course, the rigging, the outboard, the span, um, the blade area, and uh, the inboard. Uh, they both affect the length, and they, they affect the length of rigging and the rigging load. Um, the length of stroke. Length of stroke is a big part of uh, whether you can get a uh, positive slip or not. Uh, technique is a big factor, of course. Uh, blade work, whether you're you know, have consistent blade depth uh, is a big factor of whether the blade will slip through the water or move with the boat. Uh, boat speed is a factor. Power application uh, appears to be a factor. Uh, and then the environmental conditions uh, that affect boat speed, but also rough water, wind, uh, the resistance on the boat, uh, another one. Uh, and so these uh, these are just some of the factors that can influence blade slip. And I, I put those up there because I just wanted to bring this back together. I don't have the answers, but I know all those will affect the uh, blade slip. So I think I went through the path pretty good, Peter. Um, thank you. I th I'm sure this presentation will be available after the conference. And um, uh, Rosie, I meant to thank you at the beginning. I'm nervous up here. Uh, for the opportunity to speak and for the introduction, Peter. Thanks. Uh, wait. I, I do have a few minutes. Okay. Uh, oh. We just have time if anyone um, has uh, questions. Can I just ask two questions? Um, when you were talking, uh, comparing the semi-final to the final, you seem to take into account conditions. But when you were comparing the one athlete from year on year, um, you didn't say that, uh, mention the condition changing at all on that. Is I, that something you took into account? No. As a matter of fact, those are the four curves. Those were three curves, same athlete, uh, that I did not change the... Uh, that was actually the boat speed. Those were the curves from that uh, uh, athlete. Do you think it's a valid comparison if you haven't taken conditions into account? Uh, I think if we're looking at uh, things like uh, acceleration, um, although in, in headwinds the acceleration might not be as quick, some factors would be, uh, some factors maybe not as much. Okay, and my second question was um, in terms of the stuff you were talking about, the blade slip, uh, it looks as if you did all your information from video analysis. I just wonder how you got power application from video analysis. No, that was, uh, that was a uh, sort of a determination I've been making with uh, the rigging analysis I've been doing um, uh, for the crews I've been working with. And I know that uh, if you don't apply a lot of power uh, and that your, your blade... Uh, won't go through the water, or it won't. Uh, I know it's a factor, but it was just the some of the athletes, that was weaker athletes, let's say, with similar rigs, had better blade slip because they weren't the blade wasn't being pushed through the water. Okay, so you're using Peach or Empower or Locks? No, measuring it, but I know the athlete's power. 
Okay. Yeah, no, I'm not. I just knew the, the weaker athletes and the stronger athletes. No, okay. it's very unscientific. Right. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, in order to create this data, the first thing that you did was um, determine the length of the boat. But not all boats are the same length, so how did you know what that boat length was? Um, so I went to, uh, for the uh, M packers, you can go to the boat manufacturer's chart. Uh, I went to the uh, manufacturer's chart, looked at the, um, the crew size, and did my best guess. Once I have that information, uh, from this information, I, I get a, a speed, a split speed. I can calculate the split speed of that one stroke. And I compare that to the split speed uh, on, the, um, on the race table. And if it's, uh, and you can see if you're close or not, because if the, if the time is uh, uh, much below the split speed, then you'd say, oh, I've guessed they're not using that boat that that's, long, that's that long, and uh, I should redo it with a shorter boat length. And so I typically look to get a, a speed that's just above what their average speed is in that part of the race. Yeah. Good name. I would like to thank you, Mike, for a very interesting presentation. Obviously, you've done a lot, tremendous amount of work with that analysis. Uh, really impressive. I just only can comment that uh, about terminology, because what you call catch is actually is entry in common language, you know, uh, and because the catch is where the oar changes direction uh, at the front end, and it contradicts actually with your definition of the finish, because finish you define uh, like in common language where the oar changes direction, right? Same. But my question is about your last uh, slide. Uh, you, you're talking about factors of uh, sleep, of, of the blade sleep, but you haven't said um, what, which direction. For example, longer catch angle, does it increase blade sleep or decrease? And all, can you just go back yes. to the last slide and just explain us the direction of the uh, effect? Um, a greater catch angle will improve your blade slip, but also increases your drive time. But a, a, greater, a greater catch angle will, to, to a certain point, will improve the uh, blade slip. So you'll have a more positive. When I say improve, positive, um, uh, worse is, would be negative or more negative. Um, so, yeah. The, the longer catch angle, the less blade slip, right? The, the more catch angle, the better, the greater the, the positive blade slip. Other factors? Um, yeah, the rigging, the span, the, the load. Um, I think that uh, where we've had negative blade slip or uh, we've improved blade slip by uh, the athlete. It was just a strong, strong athlete with a very light load. And from the video, when you look at the video, it looks like the blade is being ripped through the water and the water's moving around the blade in all, all parts of the blade rather than the blade locking on. And so I, when I talk about uh, uh, the second point here, rigging outboard span uh, and blade area, uh, it, that relates to the load of the rigging, how hard it is for the athlete to pull. And sometimes we just under rig and uh, when the rigging load is too light, the athletes have the opportunity to pull the blade right through. Thank you very much. That's great. Thank you very much, Mike, for a great, pre wonderful presentation. Okay, um, I just wanted to, thank you, I just wanted to, um, uh, the three slides now, because uh, the next section, we've decided to try to put together some short pieces that you might want to go to see, so that there's some multiple choices about where you go. Um, so the, oh, it's gone again. So the, the from 3.30 till 4 o'clock, the first presentation is the update on the Tokyo weather course. So if any of you have got any more questions or you'd like to talk to Hank Yarn about more detail on that, uh, then he will be in this room 
on that side of the divider because the room's going to be divided into two. Uh, if you'd like to go to Nick Baker's uh, presentation, Nick is going to focus in on the particulars of coaching PR1 and PR2 uh, rowers. Uh, so what are the things that you need to consider um, that are different from coaching other, other uh, rowers and other para rowers? So he will be in this side of the, of the room. Um, and if you want to go to uh, the uh, to hit talk to Mike again, and Mike has some more detail that he can share with you, uh, then he's going to be in the Endeavour room. Um, so at uh, the next bit is um, four o'clock till four thirty. So again, we have three presentations. Presentation one, which is Whistler, which is about women elite women's coach program, and we've got. Um, some people here who are on that scheme, so they can talk about it with Jack Mina. That's going to be in presentation one. Uh, using FISA race data, Adrian Cassidy would very much like people that would like to tell him how they would like that data to be prepared. So what is going to happen is FISA are working with Adrian, so they'll write some software so they can take the GPS data and produce data for you. So you compare your own crews, or you can compare crews that uh, in your event, or you can even compare event by event. So Adrian would like some help from you in how best to do that. So he's got some ideas, but he'd like some help. So please, if you're interested in that area, that will be in presentation two here. And um, successfully integrating U.S. students into national programs will be Pete Shepard in the Endeavour Room. So the one across there. Oh, Discovery Room. Where's Discovery? Oh, so sorry, sorry. Jacqueline is in Endeavour. The other two are in here. Uh, and then the third one is there's two options at 4:30 till 5. So Discovery Room here which will be uh, Pascal Bouton talking about uh, seeding. And then if you uh, want to go to Talent ID, Axel Muller, who did a PhD in Talent ID, will be presenting in the Endeavour Room. So hopefully I haven't confused you too much, but there are some choices and you just need to decide where you're going to go. The presentations will be about 20 minutes with a few minutes for questions, and then you have five minutes to move rooms. Okay. And there'll be a moderator trying to make sure that you all move in and move out of the rooms at the right times. So hopefully you'll enjoy that. And then um, can I just say that we don't actually come back again together. So I would like to thank all of our speakers, um, all of our guys that have helped, the AV guys. Um, so uh, it's been, uh, I think it's been very interesting. Certainly I found it very interesting. But I think our speakers have done a fabulous job on a, quite a wide range of subjects. So I'd like to thank them uh, finally because we won't be back together again. So thank you very much indeed. OK, okay. Uh, so it's coffee break. And then 3.30, go to the first presentation. Not yet. <laughs> Perform performance coach. <laughs> yep. So I, I was brief to give special considerations on PR1 and PR2 rowers. Um, I appreciate that some of you, some of the topics I might be teaching you to suck eggs might be fairly obvious. Hopefully all of you can go away with at least one thing to think about, you might take home, you might investigate, you might have a think about. Okay, I'm going to try and shoehorn a reasonable amount into the half hour slot. Um, and then I've put my details up at the end. So if you've got any questions, just pick up the phone, email me. I think that's probably the best use of our time today. If there's anything burning and we've got a few minutes, we'll try and accommodate that at the end. Okay, so uh, thanks for the introduction. Obviously, I've been at uh, British Rowing now for, I call seven long years, but I've loved every minute of it and I've learned more working within para rowing than I ever have within able-bodied rowing without a doubt just because every day is a problem solving uh, opportunity. Uh, the first thing is the session aims so this is supposed to be thought-provoking rather than exhaustive we've only got half an hour. 
Um, hopefully fairly relaxed and interactive, like feel free to heckle me, Tom. Um, and then there will be details at the end if you want to dig in, like I've mentioned. Okay. Uh, so I thought it poignant to go through some of the things that we've worked on in terms of safety, given the sad occurrences at last year's World Championships. I think it's actually quite important to go through some of the stuff that we've worked hard uh, to improve and to make sure these guys are safe. Uh, the first thing that we, we've done is we've done a lot of comprehensive testing on capsize of boats that use pontoons. Um, one of the more shocking things I remember watching was our 50 kilo development pathway coach trying to turn one of these boats over with someone in it when it had capsized. Uh, it was physically impossible. She couldn't do it with all her body weight and all her strength. Um, me at 90 kilos being reasonably fit was only just able to do it. Um, so if you've got someone that goes over, is struggling, loses consciousness and can't get themselves out, that's something to bear in mind. Um, we've all taken to carrying these knives with us at all times. Um, these have a really sharp seat belt cutter on them that will go through all straps in about five seconds. We've practiced this and we managed to get someone out in under 10 seconds. Uh, that's including cutting the foot straps as well. Okay, and that was doing it eyes closed, just feeling for where the straps were, given you're in cold, dark water as well. Obviously, we're in a pool environment. Um, the straps that we use, everyone builds their straps to their athletes. Everyone's got different types of straps. But the most important thing is we go for these hard neon loops uh, that people can get even a cold, injured finger into and at least have a go at pulling the straps off. Okay, so that's that one. Um, we also make sure every single athlete, as I'm sure you all do, go through capsize tests. And we also give them the opportunity to do this at least once a year, just to make sure they're confident with the extra time they're going to spend underwater and they've got clarity of mind in terms of what they need to do to get out if no one's around uh, or within close enough range. And then the final thing is, as much as some of our guys detest swimming, we make sure they get in the pool and they're confident and they're able swimmers. Okay. So, on to weight training. Um, so for us, we put a lot of effort into hip extension for the PR2s, no surprise. Uh, we try to do it in neutral positions, so we make sure that they're using glutes, hamstrings, rather than spinal flexion, if that makes sense. Um, and then we look at thoracolumbar extension for the PR1, so as much as they can get from spinal flexion around the thoracic, and anything that they can recruit below injury levels or below the strap level, we will look to train in some way or another. Um, we, especially with the PR2s, we look to do a lot of single leg variations to our hip extension work to make sure they're able to resist rotational forces that they might be experiencing because of their disabilities and how they're applying force in the boat. Um, we do a higher number of weight sessions uh, than we used to. Um, we've got quite specific targets for each session that we put our athletes through. Uh, and obviously those targets will change towards the summer as we move to more speed and power-based work as you would with a traditional rowing program as well. Um, but we, we tend to tackle some of the technical issues that we see in the weights room as well. So we have a couple of sessions that are aimed specifically at certain joints, end range control, mobility, various bits like that. Um, and ultimately, the extra, extra load in the weight room, especially through the winter, keeps them healthy and they're able to tolerate rowing load with less stress injuries and joint injuries, etc. So I'm just going to play these videos um, one by one as they come down, or my trusty friend at the back will for me. Um, the first one is just some manually resisted hip extension work that we do in the gym. I um, don't know if he's able to play the first one. Um, so nothing particularly exciting, but you can control the concentric and eccentric load. And that's our weight coach. He's got certain strategies he plays with as you're going through the season to kind of vary the load uh, concentrically and eccentrically. Um, the next one, we do a lot of uh, cable loaded things. Um, obviously, there's a lot of shearing force that goes through the spine in these guys when they're rowing. Um, and we try and make sure they're safe with conditioning that movement pattern um, with that, that movement. And then, oh, sorry. And then the last one is the one that we do both single and double leg variations of, um, which is just your uh, plated hip extension there, or reverse hype, or whatever you'd like to call it. Okay, and we've obviously got other bits and bobs that we do with our PR1s that I don't have videos of. So we, for example, we'll put our PR1s into ergo seats, and we'll put them on our track, and they'll have ropes where they do literally just thoracic extension against the load, and they'll work through 50 meters of rope, just bringing the weights towards them again. It's just conditioning that thoracic extension. Uh, and we found the ergo setup was actually the easiest one to get them loaded in safely. You can just put their feet up against some dumbbells. It's a natural position. They're relatively safe in it. 
Okay, so key joint health kind of ties into what we're doing in the gym, but we do a few different things. So we've, we use this um, Don Gatherer neck harness um, to work on cervical paravertebral strength um, and also lateral strength for that area because quite a few of our guys with spinal injuries came in with minor cervical disc injuries um, and building up the structure around that area enabled us to get more training load into them and just kept them healthy. We, lot, we actually got rid of quite a few um, lower arm sort of neural issues they were struggling with as well by improving the structure around this area. Um, we also do a lot of stop Pilates work, so our physio is stop Pilates trained. Uh, we do a lot of work around mobility of specific joints. We do a lot of work on end range control, so making sure they're actually able to recruit muscles in a controlled fashion right at the end of these joint ranges. Um, and then obviously we condition specific movements that they might be weak in. Uh, the last one is we, ha we use these free forms, which are basically just um, discs with wheels that you can help mobilize yourself with. Um, we do a lot of work below injury level um, with spinal injuries uh, because we found that even though it's more passive, um, getting those joints more mobile and more active allows better movements in the boat. They're just freer to move. So we, we would do this every morning before Tom used to go rowing. Okay, so that's quite a useful use of that tool as well. Um, Technical slash lifestyle considerations, I've kind of put a few bits into these next few slides that cover both those areas. Um, these guys are often stepping straight into high performance programs with no prior experience of the sport. They might have come from another athletic background, but normally you pick people up and you're trying to teach them to row as the very first thing. Um, they usually, obviously, because of that, need to make rapid technical progression alongside rapid physical change, which is, can be challenging in various ways. You're trying to throw a lot at them in a short space of time and they need to develop a high performance athlete lifestyle very quickly. Um, we found that peer support can really boost the coach input on this. If, you can, if you're lucky enough to have a centralized system or if you've got para athletes that are in close proximity to Olympic athletes, just getting them to spend time together out of the pressurized high performance environment and share stories, share anecdotes and learn about how to live as a rower is a really useful way of upskilling them and it's not the same voice every time. Um, and we also found that uh, to my detriment, which I'll explain in a bit, you can get rapid technical gains from actually rowing with the athletes yourself. Like you don't necessarily need to do huge mileages, but just getting in, kinesthetically putting feelings through the boat, you can really help people learn quite quickly, um, rather than just trying to describe. It's a much slower way of getting people to learn. Um, so this video at the bottom, which my trusty friend is going to play for me, um, is one that, that's the top. If you could just play the one at the bottom for me. Uh, so the one at the bottom is one that uh, one of my athletes hates me digging out. Um, this is Lauren when she first started. Um, Lauren Rolls, who was in the, the double in 2016. Uh, and as you can see, at that point, we had about six or seven months to get her, um, I think it was even less than that, potentially five months to get her to qualify that boat at Egg Ballet that year. And then the, the video above is what we managed to get done within the 17 months. That was just before Rio. So that just kind of highlights how quickly you need to get these people, A, physically ready to take the training load and ready to deal with all the psychological stress that comes with competing at that level. Okay. Um, so just a couple of general points for those that don't normally coach Paralympic athletes. Um, the boat dynamics are still exactly the same. If you can coach rowing, you can coach PR1s, you can coach PR2s. You're essentially just changing your vocabulary to how their body works. It's not particularly difficult. You've just got to think and be a bit more creative uh, with what you're saying. Um, it's still very much body weight driven. Um, I'll come on to explain that a bit more in a second. Um, very much through the foot plate, even with PR1s and PR2s. Um, every disability will absolutely need a completely individual setup. You might start with a stock seat, you might start with a stock foot plate, but I cannot recommend enough playing with everything. And at the start of the season, just giving yourself a month, a month and a half to change everything deliberately. Because we have found speed from some of the strangest modifications to boats, and I'm sure you all have as well at certain points. Um, rowing with able-bodied athletes, like I've said, is a great way to upscale, upskill and quickly develop the boat feel. Um, that's my back after spinal surgery. So uh, maybe be careful if you're not well conditioned to do this. I think I probably backed myself when I wasn't quite ready to do it. Um, so that comes with a health warning. Um, the bigger boat setups can be great for learning. So in, in the past, we've set up some PR1 doubles, um, which take a bit of 
fiddling around, but you can get um, PR1 setups into a TA double, or what's now a PR2 double. Um, it's just a really good way to learn around a faster pickup, um, a slightly faster moving boat, how to let go of something that's moving slightly quicker. Um, so this is what I was going to explain. So with the, with the deregulation of the strapping, um, PR1s, core stability is even more crucial, ability to row floats off of an obvious one now. Um, and whatever you can get from the residual strength or any kind of residual posterior chain with spinal injuries, um, it will help. If you can in some way manipulate the strapping to get connection through the foot plate, you will get more force through the handles. Okay. Um, and then with the PR2s, um, oh, with the PR2s lower body strength, we actually spend a lot of time training now because of the deregulation of the strapping. You can get connection through the foot plate and you can also get some kind of movement at the knee joint, which you'll see now if you watch most of the rowing at that level. So we do a lot of single leg cycling. We do, um, we do seated deadlifts now where we give support to the athlete's hips, but we still get him to drive through the floor with his good foot. Uh, and you can get quite creative with how you develop that lower body strength and how you connect it through the full chain. Um, so body compositions, um, we set quite specific targets for our athletes um, in both skin folds, so the amount of fat they're carrying and also in their body mass, how much they're actually weighing. A lot of the data that we, we use to set these targets just comes from knowing the athlete and watching them train for a period of time. Um, there isn't really a one-size-fits-all. Obviously, you've got all kinds of body types. Um, the one thing with people with um, lower limb injuries or missing lower limbs or spinal injuries is their calorific needs will be slightly lower because of the musculature they're using to train. Um, you want to optimize the ability to complete the training load um, or race with the appropriate uh, target. So in the winter, you're obviously going to carry a bit more fat. This is nothing new. Um, just to make sure that you can safely tolerate a much higher training load and then you'll time when you come down to your optimum point for that sort of two or three window, two or three week window where you can operate at that level. Um, the other thing to consider for people with spinal injuries is because they lack that daily impact at the lower, um, lower extremities of their bodies, vitamin D and calcium levels are important because they're much more susceptible to fractures and breaks even when they're transferring from their chairs. So it's worth just considering vit D testing and calcium testing to make sure they're up there with those essential uh, vitamins and minerals as well. Um, heat management. So there is a, a study up on, up on there, which I'm not going to sort of read all of the, the words to you, but in short, these guys really struggle because of the poor circulation below the injury level. They don't really have the ability to, to vasodilate, so they don't lose heat particularly well from below the injury point. They're also, their evaporative cooling is quite poor below the injury level, so their ability to sweat and lose heat is very low. Um, so I'm sure most of you will be looking at ways to keep these guys cool as you come towards Tokyo. There's a lot of really cool tech coming out at the moment. Uh, there's phase change materials that freeze at about 21 degrees, and they stay cool for about two hours. And you can quite happily build those into tech tops, all-in-ones, various bits like that. And there are also, for when people get out of the boats, um, powered cooling jackets now where you can get ice cold water through on battery packs. You can get people straight out of the boat into those to keep them safe. If they're going to struggle losing heat. Um, seating, so this is a bit of a, uh, perhaps some of the British people uh, might get this. I might have to explain it to everyone else. But we had a cartoonist in the UK called Heath Robinson who was very famous for um, creating these ridiculous contraptions to solve very simple problems. And um, I think, like I explained earlier, with, with the seating, um, get creative, get in the workshop, build things. It might look ridiculous, but if it does the job, you can then refine it, build it out of carbon, make it light, fit it to the boat. But don't be afraid to get really creative and just get stuck into trying all kinds of things to get the most out of these guys' bodies, however they might work. Um, so, like I say, persistence is incredibly important. Um, I remember when we, we first built Tom Agar's seat going into Rio, um, we spent a reasonable amount of money on it and about a month's worth of trying to get it right and I almost threw it in the bin. The next day I made one change and it was the best seat you'd ever rode in. And it was a very simple change. So I think that was a bit of a lesson to me, like just be persistent. Um, it's not a waste of time. Um, obviously there's weight considerations. It's quite hard to get PR1 boats especially down to weight. Um, so you're going to be trying to spend a bit more money on some of the materials you consider these seats being made from. Repeatability. When you've made this contraption and you're looking at it thinking, okay, I have no idea how I made that, 
um, it's quite important to keep a decent log and record of how you went through the iterative process to get to that, that seat that works for your athlete. Um, make sure it's within the rules, goes without saying. Um, and then using a collective thought process. I remember a couple of times when I was looking at a few seats we were developing where the S&C coach or the physio will pick something out that you just would have missed as a coach. I think sometimes it's quite hard to not think it's your project and your thing and not include some of the experience you've got around you as well. Okay, and then I think we've got a reasonable amount of time for questions. That's good. That, that ended up being a little bit quicker than I was, I was thinking it might. Okay, so I'm going to open the floor to... I've really rushed through that, but I, I'm going to open the floor to any questions if anyone wants to dig into anything. Or, or not. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, one of our athletes uh, had reasonable scoliosis as part of his injury. Um, so we ended up actually building his seat slightly off center with a slight rise on one side, which is probably something you would think, oh my God, but that's how that guy's body worked. Um, it enabled him to train longer, harder, reduced his injury level. Um, and it's not always the most traditional things. You, you might look at someone and think, how do we straighten them out? But sometimes with the kind of mechanical and physical injuries, that's just how they work and their body is safe that way. That's how they live day to day. Um, so that's one small example. Yep. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, brilliant point. Yeah. No, no, that's, that's absolutely right. So that, I think that the textbook kind of goes out the window a little bit when you're trying to build, build these seats um, and get the most from your guys in the boats. But the feedback from them is alongside raw boat speed and the feedback from them. Those are your kind of two most important things. Anything outside of that, don't go into it with any preconceptions because it'll just get in the way. Um, so absolutely involve the guys. Their feedback is gold. Anyone else? Yep. Any difference in training um, loads PR1, PR2, volume, intensity? Yeah, um, so not enormous for us. So if I were to give you a typical change, when we do our, uh, the bulk of our aerobic water training sessions, we'll have our PR3s going through, say, 14K. We would then move it down to 12 for our PR2s. Um, and our PR1s, depending on where they're at, we will go between 10 and 12. Um, I think the thing to remember is, Modifying it too much that way is not necessarily that. It doesn't necessarily line up with what you're trying to do because the PR1s are going to be racing a much more aerobic race over a longer period of time. So actually their aerobic volume needs to go up. But then you've got to consider the musculature they're using, like upper body compared to full body, lower body, their aerobic load is going to be more challenging because they're using those muscles day to day as well. So the general like, mechanical load that goes through them is quite high. Um, so it's not necessarily a simple answer, but we do we do make that consideration in certain ways. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. A standard setup. Woo. In in which in PR uh, one, obviously you're gonna have your. Okay, a standard setup doesn't really exist. Um, I suppose. The things, you're trying to, the things you're trying to consider are, it, whether it's a male or a female, within those groups, you're going to have someone who's a power athlete, they're going to be tall, they're going to be strong, they're going to be more aerobic. You might consider the loading that you put them through. So if you've got someone who's super strong, you might put them on a slightly tighter span and give them a longer arc to row. Um, there's various things you can play around with that. Um, other than that, it's very specific. Like, some of our guys, for absolutely no reason, prefer rowing with their feet in shoes. Some prefer them on the flat boards with the straps. Couldn't tell you why. Um, but, yeah, this is quite a difficult question to ask. There isn't necessarily a standard setup um, for anyone, but those are some of the things I'd consider. Anyone else? Dan?
Interestingly, not much. Uh, that's a good question. We, our, our program, even when we were racing over the 1K distance, was probably more a traditional rowing training load anyway. Um, we increased our mileages and some of the considerations around the weight room to make sure the guys could deal with an extra bit of um, aerobic load. But we were pretty much already set up to make that transition, assuming it was going to happen. Um, some, some other programs I know when we were racing over the 1K distance had a much higher level of intensity going towards that racing, whereas we stuck to the aerobic base um, as you would in a traditional program. We, we put, yeah, so funnily, funnily enough, we did more strength training to ensure that they could do more rowing, if that makes sense. Um, and it became more specific, so we were trying to solve problems in the gym rather than just doing traditional lifting. It was like, if that guy's getting stress injuries in that area, how can we support that better? How can we make sure he can withstand more mileage without that problem occurring again? Anyone else? We're done. Cool. Thank you very much. Cheers. Do you think? Do you want to wait? Yeah. Is the other one finished over? Round the mic, put the blade slip. Has it? Okay. Right. All right, we're going to start in one minute for the discussion on integrating USA students into your programs. So, Brits. <laughs> <laughs> He's a dinosaur. Uh, coach of, uh, junior and under 23 going for GB Roy. He's going to discuss integrating students from the USA into your back in year program. Okay. Um, all right. We'll, we'll, we'll get started. And if people arrive a bit late, they can uh, join in. Um, it, very much a sort of health warning on it. It's very much from a GB perspective and those from other nations that have students that have gone abroad, um, you know, you, you perhaps different, have a different perspective on it. What I'll do is start with how big it is today for us in GB. Um, as of Tuesday, we had 86 rowers based in US programs that I know of. And there's probably more there. There's probably, I suspect that we've got over 100 over there. Um, uh, that covers 18 women's programs, 12 men's programs, and, and a total of 22 different programs because there'll be some males and females at, at both. Um, the, in particular, if you take Yale, which is where our biggest cohort is, we've got 20 there, 12 males and 8 females there. And that's just in one program. And I think the, the, the challenge is that it's not going to go away. Um, the, as much as all of us in different nations sort of, um, you know, Thomas Paulson was moaning about it yesterday. Um, you know, I know Gianni uh, has the same problems as well. It is not going to go away. The, the draw, the attractiveness of different types of rowing, and I think that's the, one of the bits that I think is important that we remember these are still youngsters who want a different experience in the sport and global um, global education opportunities are now available and although we talked about US people but I have people in Australia who are contacting me who have Brits who've gone to Australia to go to Sydney University I've got people oh yeah, our lightweight girl last year was in the Netherlands um, it's not just to to universities in the US although that's the biggest proportion um, as I said, our numbers of involved are increasing. Um, 40, we've got 86 now. I think the the bit that's the fact, the main one of the main things around it is what, why are they why are they going? And the global education is one. Um, the financial scholarships in some universities is is also relevant. Um, it's not the same for the Ivy League universities. Those that know that will know that the Ivy Leagues, you, you, you're means tested, um, whereas you go to Ohio or 
UW, UW in Seattle, then they get $30,000 scholarships. And, the, and wh why, wh why wouldn't a British athlete go there for a scholarship when they can do three years in the UK and come out with a debt of 30000 and, and ha instead of having everything paid. So um, I think we have to accept that currently it's, it's, gonna, it's, it's there, it's going to happen. Um, the sport is important in the universities and in the UK, um, those that are involved in university programmes in the UK will, will know that um, the sport time is being taken away a lot of the time by academia. Um, so the draw to, to go to a university where sport is high on the agenda uh, is not to say in the UK the universities don't value sport, but they don't value it in the same way. Um, the Title IX for the females, um, so where universities have to spend the same amount on women's sport as they do on men's sport, and the men's sport predominantly is on um, the American football. Um, and as I said, they get a different experience of our sport. And is, is that actually a bad thing? Okay, it may hold up athletes coming through into our Olympic program, but that's ultimately what we're about, is running an Olympic program. And if it affects our under 23s on the way, but we have to be able to hold on to the athletes. Um, the other bit that we're also finding is that we get we get people who've gone to university who'd never rowed. So people from the UK have gone there, learnt, they, w they went on a basketball scholarship, for example, and then picked up rowing and have learnt to row and been successful at it. So there's, a, there's an added advantage from a talent ID point of view for us that we get walk-ons, as they call them, coming in and they teach them to row for us uh, as well. So we, for two years ago and three years ago, we had a, a female that had learnt at Virginia, for example. Um, we're also finding that, and this is an, another example of a, a walk-on at Brown. She went to Brown, never rode before, but her family is British, but live in the Bahamas. So we've got people who who have homes away from the UK as well that we're finding out that row in these college programs. So there is, a, there is an advantage for that, that we're finding extra people that we didn't, we know, didn't think we had. Um, it doesn't work for everyone. In the early stages, we definitely had females, in particular, who went to some of the universities uh, and didn't enjoy it. After one year, they left and came back again. Um, that's that's you know, still common in some cases. Um, we've got one female this year that went to Virginia last year and has come back and w probably won't go back. Um, year one is probably quite a critical stage for them. For many of them, it is leaving home. For, for a large number of them, it's leaving home for the first time and so it can be quite stressful. And we tend not to have many of them who have year one as under 23s um, of the four years you have as an under 23 come through into our program as a, at under 23 level. Um, what, what is important for us is that when the NCAAs and the IRAs finish, that's a line in the sand where their job is generally done out there. Um, I say that, that that is a line in the sand. It's not qu quite strictly true because there's things like the Harvard Yale race, Harvard Yale boat race each year, which is another week further on. And then the West Coast universities operate differently to the East Coast universities. So the West Coast exams often run a bit later after, after the NCAAs for the females uh, and the IRAs, uh, whereas the East Coast ones have, have finished already by the time they get to that bit at the end of May, beginning of June. Um, from a GB point of view, it, it's, it has its advantages that we get to work with those US-based rowers from the beginning of June. Whereas those based in the UK, um, they, they stay in their clubs until post Henley Royal Regatta. So we have two streams running basically um, so alongside each other through the through the through the season. The people in the US have to complete a number of ergo assessments 
for us. Um, and then after Henley Royal Regatta, my job is to, to bring both streams together. Uh, and that gives us less than three weeks to the under 23s generally. So it's, you know, in, in GB, anyhow, we have that added confusion of Henley Royal Regatta, which is a massive draw for, for our clubs at home uh, and is something that people, youngsters, want to, want to race at. So um, again, it, it's a little bit going back to that experiences in the sport. Um, the job is, I see, is to keep hold of people and make sure that they come back at the right point into our senior programs. For us, we did benefit last year. Um, we had 19 out of our 46 open weights uh, in Sarasota um, were US based and 18 of those 19 won medals. Um, so you know, that, that's the impact that they are generally quite talented when they go um, and that's why they've been pulled over there for scholarships in various ways. Um, so the, the hit rate back for us at under 23 level is, is high. Um, yeah, we had 39 medal winning open weights from, from 46 anyhow, so we had an exceptional championships last year anyhow. Um, but that, that, uh, those numbers, um, I'll come on, back onto the numbers and how they progressed. So our timelines in 2009 was when we actually first opened it up. Up until that point, we'd, we'd actually said, no, if you go to the US, you've made a choice. Um, you, you're not going to be included in our program. Um, and then we soon realized by, by sort of 2008, we're going to cut our noses off to spite ourselves that we were going to be the losers out of this um, it, as a, a, a GB program. Um, but it, it took us until 2015 before the first one actually stepped into our senior team and that was into the women's four. Um, in 2016, we also used um, we've, we also used the FISU, the World University Rowing Championships, so not just the under-23s, we use that. And a bit of a, bit of a plug, really, I, I'd, I'd like to see more nations use that FISU event. Uh, so those of you from other nations, I think, I think if we can raise the standard of that event, that will help all of us, um, because there's no point it being one or two nations doing that. Um, our first senior that went into, obviously 2015, um, wasn't an Olympic class boat for the women's four by the, anyhow. So our first Olympic class boat uh, that somebody stepped into was in 2017. And that was a young man who was still in his last year at Princeton. So he'd, he'd graduated out of under 23s the year before. Uh, and we managed to work it that he could do that. Um, sculling and sweep. OK, the pr programs in the States are predominantly uh, sculling and uh, pro predominantly sweep but actually um, we've had good scholars go as well and in 2017 and every year since 2017 we've had scholars come back and win medals at under 23 level um, and you know if you've got eight weeks from the NCAAs or IRAs to finish then I think probably you can still do that. Um, in 2018 our under 23 women's double uh, then became the senior double um, into Plovdiv um, and then in 2019 um, we, we had the following four men sweep who won four medals but uh, no men's scholars at that point, four women sweep and one women's skull. Um, it hasn't, it, you know, it's not a perfect science for us. Um, would we prefer them, as Thomas said, to be back at home? Um, yes, but I think we have to be real about what's, what's going to happen out there in the, in the big global world. Um, so those are the numbers as it's evolved since 2009. And you've got the men, the number of medals they've got, the women, the number of medals they've got, and then the totals. And you can see how from 2009 it's really quite expanded. Um, and that reflects the, the probably the 100 athletes we've got out there. And, not all the ones we've got out there are, are good and the big job is filtering out the, the best ones from there and supporting the best ones without, um, without undermining the ambitions of the, other, of the others. Um, so the, the, to me the, the strengths and weaknesses 
um, of them going and the, str the strengths, benefits and opportunities. So we start with the, the benefits and opportunities. We've talked about some of those already. The competitive team training environment in large groups is, is a big attraction. And uh, they, you know, the competition to get in the first boat is something that's, that's is attractive to them. Um, the great competition experiences they get, the the side by side racing um, through their match racing season that they do, and then going into their regional championships, which then go into their national championships, are 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 you know are difficult to replicate on a on a daily basis. They they're predominantly in eights for their for their racing, um, but. Actually, if you dig deeper, they do do quite a bit of small boat work through the winter and autumn period, um, more than perhaps people give them credit for. Um, a lot of the West Coast universities will go and do uh, the head of the America or something in, in small boats as well. Um, so they're not getting no small boat experience. They're, they're, are they getting enough? Okay, who knows, but we can't control that. Um, the access to rowers from the beginning of June is, as I said already, is, is something that actually perhaps helps us uh, back here. Um, I think they do get good technical coaching and I think one of the fundamentals they, they come back with generally is very good blade skills with putting the blade in the water and getting the blade hooked up um, and is something that you know, I think we, sh we shouldn't dismiss. Um, the other bit is that the athlete grows as a person that I think we shouldn't underestimate the, the bit about you know, going away from home, go, perhaps, okay, you go to any university in the UK, you're going away from home generally, but going overseas, dealing with, dealing with their coaches there, having conversations with their coaches when, when I've said to, when I've asked them, like, you've got to do a, an ergo test by this date, you know, you've got to, they've got to go and work, talk with their coaches and plan how that's going to happen. So. There, there are many aspects of them growing as a person that I think makes them a better person when they come back. Um, the, the negatives, um, the US college program goals are not always aligned to national team goals. Um, the long-term athlete development is something you know, we, we tend to see, they accelerate quite quickly and then they flatline a bit for the last two years when they get in their final two years and that's part of the programming that, that happens. Um, there's definitely a lack of s and in, in their programs that we would, um, we would want um, for our model of program um, and as I say the, the model of program, model of training is often different um, time restraints. Just for my understanding, what is s Strength and conditioning, strength training. Um, they, they're off the water during the winter period or there are rules around how much they can be coached through the winter. Um, obviously all those programs, they push those rules to the limits. So um, you know, there are times when they are training on their own led by the captain rather than led by the coaching team. Um, the big, one of the big threats to this is the lure of internships and going into the big wide world of work and um, particularly those that have gone to some of the more high profile academic universities, their alumni and the attraction of getting a job in New York in the financial market or something is a huge, huge lure and a huge risk to this for all, for all of us that, um, you know, the, they have big alumni connections, big alumni networks, and they're part of that is, well, the person next to you, me in my study group at Yale is going to go and get a job paying mega bucks next week, and you're going to go back and row, try and row in an under-23 team. So that's a huge threat, the, the internship draw. Um, the perception of US-based rowers by UK-based coaches and rowers it's not, I'll be straight, it's not, um, it's not everybody's cup of tea back here, particularly the universities back here. 
Um, you know, if we think there's 100 athletes out there that they'd like spread back through our university programs, that's, that's a challenge. Um, so every year I will get challenged by our university coaches, is it, is it fair for the US rowers? I, I say it's not unfair, it's just different, is, my, is the way I describe it. Um, and in some cases, and this is no, not being offensive to any of our school programs, it, it, it is, some of them, it is just an extension of their school, school program in terms of their life. So people who've been to a boarding school here in the UK, they're just moving to a, a boarding school in, in their world at times out there, okay? Um, so that, that's, that's what I mean by it's often an extension of our school program. So how they live and operate when, if they're being boarders in some of our boarding schools is no different to when they get out there and, and the behaviors that they perhaps operate it with in that. Um, so some thoughts on how to manage the situation I think is and evolve. Um, to, to, my, to my view we have to build relationships and partnerships with those programs. Um, when you've got 28 different programs or 22 different programs to, to touch base with that's a challenge and is a full-time job for somebody to, to communicate with those coaches and stuff. So you, we, I have to prioritize the bigger programs and the coaching s staff in those. Um, I have to have good regular communication with them. I have to make, get them on board. They're generally keen to be on board because actually they know their programs finish at the beginning of June and they don't start again until the beginning of September. So July, you know, June, July, August, they know, they understand the basic principles of developing an athlete and if they have three months off, that's not good for their programs either. So actually, they tend to want to encourage their youngsters to come and row internationally because it's another eight weeks of training for them. So that, that's, I think, some, a bit to play on with those programs and those coaches is that we actually have that communication and, and understand that that partnership that's going to work. Um, I think managing expectations is quite important. Um, uh, Laurel yesterday explained about one of her fem the young female rowers going into the US women's program and she'd been top dog um, through all her under 23 and college program and then she drops in right at the bottom of, of their national program. And I think that's, that post-graduation thing is quite important. Um, how, how a youngster perceives where they are when they've won everything um, through their college career or nearly won everything through their college career and then they find they're back at the bottom of the pile again. Um, the scale bit is, is important for, for a, a number of those 86 that have gone is that sort of 60 of them probably aren't good enough and but they still they think they want to do it so we I have to deal with the making sure that the the scale is understood by by everybody um, we have to educate the athletes on the trials process Tom, Thomas Poulsen he indicated yesterday as well how he had to reset when his American based athletes come back um, we have to understand, uh, okay, uh, filter out the good ones early. Um, that's again about the scale bit. And you know, by the time we get to, to June, I will have said to some of them already, sorry, you're not good enough. And that's without having a water performance. It's more on pure physicality of trying to, of what a future Olympian would look like. Um, understand that there will be gaps in their profiles and recognize and identify these. I think. You know, with any developing athlete, there's always a gap somewhere. It just might be a different gap to what we've been used to. Um, you know, they, the, the gaps isn't around race, how to race or anything like that, but it will be around some S&C, some strength training or some aerobic capacity um, and things like that. Um, 
recognize what conditions they are, they are in when they do come back. And again, that was raised yesterday around the, ment the mental and physically, mentally and physically, that they come off the back of a championships and they are peaked for those championships or tapered and peaked and ready to race at the end of May. And you've got to understand that mentally and physically they are in different spaces to, to where your other athletes are. So in, in the UK, we've got our university programs here trying to accelerate through to Henley. Um, and then I have to deal with that mental and physical drop after Henley as well for those athletes. And you've got two streams never quite aligned. Um, do they need to be the complete athlete while they're in the US? Probably not. Um, as I say, this is uh, how we work in, the, in, the, in GB. I, I imagine for a smaller nation where you might have fewer rowers, that that's more challenging if you lose some of your top, you know, Gianni I know would be one who's very frustrated by in Greece that he has very few athletes and he, the ones, they all tend to be drawn off. Like I think his women's pair that have qualified for the Olympics have, have got, are going to Washington next year. Um, and there is top two females under 23 or senior. Um, and the, in the end, the biggest challenge for all of us is we get the right ones back. Whether, and we, you know, the, we, we don't lose them from the sport before they've had a chance to be successful Olympians. Um, so th those, are my, those are my take home bits, I suppose, um, from, from the experience. And it's, it's, we got to, you know, I made a note here, you know, our sport as a whole has to evolve to this situation. Um, it isn't going to go away in the very near future. At, at, some, at some point, US rowing might decide actually they could do with some US rowers being developed in US universities and find a way to, to support that. You know, for instance, the Yale men's eight had no US men in it at all. It had five Brits, uh, an Italian, a Swiss, and a Frenchman or something like that, but it had no, it had no US rowers in it. So that, you know, where we're getting some, some development done, other programs aren't getting development done. Ah, that's me. Thank you for the presentation. I mean, we have also similar problems, but um, again, why you have so many people in Yale? You have a partnership with Yale? No. <laughs> um, we, what, what, one of the things that happens is that a school will end up having a bit of a connection with a university. So um, we've had, um, uh, like John's one of our teachers, teachers at Radley, he, he, there's a, a chain of Radley students that have gone to, to Yale. St. Paul's School, which is one of our top schools as well, uh, a lot of their athletes have gone to Harvard. So it becomes word of mouth from, from athlete to athlete rather than anything with us. Like, we've, we've not sent anyone anywhere. <laughs> um, so, so we have a big contingent at Harvard as well, uh, but they, uh, most of those have come from one school. Um, so that, that's, that's what we, we probably have. 10, 10 or 12 males at Harvard as well, um, who, but they're all, most of them are from one school. Are you able to talk about those training model differences? If you compare the US programs to the upper echelon of universities in the UK's run program, what do you think are the training model differences? Um, I think in, so, in some of the women's programs, I think the volume is quite a lot higher in the US than here, but it, it's done run at a, a, quite a high intensity. Um, I know the, like the, some of the coaches in the bigger programs communicate with Tom Taha quite closely around what he wants for what his model of program is. And we heard Laurie yesterday talk about 200K. So I know the coach at Ohio and Washington, you know, they have big volume programs. But whether what we don't have controllers is the intensity, intensity within that. Um, I think there's a lot of competitive side-by-side -side racing or training in match boats, um, 
which which creates that competitive edge, which which is which I think can be a plus if we use it in the right way. Um, I think it's the, the volume of athletes that they have at operating at a at a good level. So, you know, take Durham for example, Durham University. They, you know, okay, they had four, three medalists last summer in our under 23 team, but they didn't, they couldn't bow to men's eight at, at, for for the for Bucks Regatta because they, they just don't have the volume of athletes operating at that level. And that's where they're crying, because you know, if, if you took the, the top 20 men that have gone to the US and spread those around those universities, then they'd, they'd operate at a, at a different level. Just, uh, do you think the Brooks effect has also impacted on that? Brooks really channeling a lot that creates that? Yeah. But Oxford Brooks have, have taken a step ahead of all our other universities, definitely. But, but our other universities are struggling to have critical mass. Now. And, and I think part of that is that a degree from Yale or Harvard or Princeton is as globally recognised, if not higher globally recognised, than a degree from Durham or Newcastle or Edinburgh, for example. Uh, I think, I think it, it will be the same as the, the temple is for the for the men. I don't think that that, that will change really. Uh, you know, it, it, it will actually hold up our crew formation for the, our under 23s because we'll our women our women we tend to select before Henley Royal, but we won't be able to do that anymore. But. Thank you very much, Peter. That was very very informative. <laughs> Mostly British people, <laughs> but there's a few. They probably want to know a bit more background as well. Yeah. Wait. Okay. So seeding, the principle and the procedure. So you can have all the criteria on the website in the session coaches. I'm sure that everybody knows the criteria of the seeding, but it's important to remind the, the most principle of the seeding. First of all, the seeding is not a predicting results, but it's a, a void to avoid having the best crew in the same heat at the beginning of the regatta. The second point is the previous race has, has the most value. The, presen the presence of 50% of a crew is considered as the same crew. In case of non-participation as one World Cup, the result of the previous World Championships result is valid. If an Olympic medalist come back without racing before, we considering his result at the Olympics. I think it's very important to remember these five principles because they are the base of the seeding. The seeding panel is rosy. Thank you, coming here. Gianni Postiglioni from Italy, Thor Nielsen from Norway, and I from France. <coughs> there are different steps for the procedure. The first one is after the closure of the entries, the seeding panel uh, 
the seeding panel, sorry, determine their own ranking. With, with the entries, we have also all the results of all the rowers. I give you an example from Linz. I choose the women's squad. We have all the entries, all the name of each crew, and all the results of each rowers during each competition, European Championships, World Cup 1, World Cup 2, World Cup 3, and also the World Championships. To see the, the crew, we take the result of the three World Cup and the previous World Championships. In yellow, you have the gold medal. In grey, the silver medal. And in uh, orange, the bronze medal. We have all this database for all the boats. So we receive this database just after the closure of the entries. It's around Friday, Friday, the Friday before the, the World Cup, for example. Then, each of us, we make our own seeding. On the picture, you have the four proposals of Jani, Rosie, Tor, and I. And you can see uh, in yellow, for example, my proposal, the difference with, with Tor. And then Rosie, the difference is in red, and Jani in blue. That takes a long time to, to do the seeding, I think around eight hours each other to realize this seeding. And we have these uh, files before Monday morning. Second example, another proposal for the European Championships in Lucerne. I don't put all the files because it was too long, but you can see the different proposal. After that, we have a Skype call on Monday morning, and we have a, a consensus to provide the preliminary, pre preliminary seeding. So that takes time to exchange, to argue, uh, and to check. And then we have the preliminary, pre preliminary it's very difficult, sorry, pre preliminary seeding and we put the preliminary seeding on the website on Monday afternoon or Tuesday morning, early as it's possible. It's not so easy to find, uh, uh, the, uh, to have a, a Skype call for us together on Monday, it's not so easy. But Tuesday morning, you can find the preliminary seeding on the website. We do that till Poznan this year. The first uh, preliminary seeding was in alphabetic order, but for Linz, we have decided to put that ranking. So that was for Poznan. You have the seeding, but order alphabetic. And then for Linz, you have the seeding with r ranking. You have here the number of entry, the number of hit, and then five hits, ten boats seeding. And here there is a spare crew because if you have a console boat, we have the spare here. So after that, the step three, all nations can put comments about the seeding with a, on a form 
and address his comments or question to the FISA office just before the draw. Not before the draw, in the morning uh, before 10 o'clock, before the last meeting of the sitting panel. The last meeting is on Thursday, just before the draw, when we saw all the entries, when the, f the, the entries are finalized. If our cancellation or changes, we can move, we can move the seeding. We also look at the comments and we give answer at the comments. This is the form provide for the comments. And then we finalize the last version of the seeding two hours before the draw. After the draw, we can provide the final seeding if you, some people ask uh, us to have the, the final seeding. Some question about uh, the procedure? Yeah, we take the result of if the last the race. Most, it's the most recent race that that boat's done. But even then, the overseas are not coming for all different reasons, mm -hmm. illness or whatever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There can be, uh, okay, I don't have the total answer, how we mm -hmm. have it, I'm just saying, especially for the Olympics, that can be very, very hard. Mm -hmm. If it's a good crew, it will survive. Of course, it doesn't, it, it doesn't depend on the seating. It's only more difficult to yeah, see the cruise than But is, is there yeah, then, okay, is there all the lanes as yeah. uh, you attack your... Yeah, but your the lanes are still randomly, yeah, so yeah. the seated cruise yeah. can be on any lane. Uh, yeah, uh, so, the seated cruise aren't in the middle of the heaps. No. No, no. Okay, okay. Uh, just... Uh, it's no, no, it's a so random. And in 2000, the Coxes 4, our Coxes 4 won, all the races are hard on the 7, it will be not seated. Mm. Mm. I think it's, it's, yeah, perhaps. It also feels a little bit of the feeling that uh, uh, since we're more, uh, uh, we're more proactive in, in, in changing lanes and so on, I think the seeding might have a bigger, of course the first race will always count, but seeding has a bigger impact mm. on the results. So it's, uh, that, seed, that seeding is really fair. It, it, uh, it I think a lot of crews will actually do everything they can to have this seeded well mm -hmm. into, the, into the Olympics. And the, only, and the only advantage for seeded crews is during time trials, because then they are able to start to yeah, work yeah, yeah. 
But in the other situation, there's always randomly mm. spread over mm. the lanes. Mm. And it's only to keep the best crews separate. But if there's a surprise, we can't have a surprise. And the other crews will be surprised too. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't have the right answer, yeah, but yeah. Uh, it is. It, it, it's not. I, I, it's, it's sometimes you it's have it's five yeah. top singers mm. in. Yeah, yeah, the top uh, uh, and, it's, yeah. And, it's, yeah. and especially yeah. then. It goes on and on. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. more important to win the heat now and than ever. I, I, I had that feeling oh. since, yeah, yeah. And since Rotterdam. It's yeah. to, to perform well and to get a good placing in the heat is very important. Yeah. 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 It is interesting because the other thing is there are people that play the game a bit. Mm. So yeah. some of them will say, well, actually, I'm good enough to get through to the A final. Mm. So yeah. they, they come you know, as low down as they can, waste as little energy mm. as they can. And then they completely screw up the next okay, round, that's and, that's and that's difficult because we can't. No, it doesn't. Yeah, but yeah. Okay, that's we, have, we have done the hard way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You saw the German, maybe it's a singer's color in what they Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh. Yeah, but he'd done Henry, and actually speaking to uh, to um, Mario, he'd, he'd won Henry, so he'd had five rounds, and Mario said that he was absolutely because we we had a um, we had a commission meeting. And he said that he was really, um, because to come and having raced five rounds, some about two or three of those were really hard races uh, in, in men's single. And then literally the Friday to have to be up to do really well. And then because he didn't, and actually we made a mistake mm. there, in that we should have run the quarterfinals and we didn't. So we should have moved the quarterfinals the next day and just not run the reps. Mm -hmm. But it was, a, it was like, oh, we've got to do something, otherwise this event's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. so no, may have the overall, uh, I think, is, is good and, uh, having principles and everybody knows, I just say, sometimes. No, I understand. Yeah, you yeah, should take the, the, a little bit the new situation mm -hmm. in that year. Yeah. Mm -hmm. also, Post for the Olympics. That, uh, if, you, if you're winning in Barrios the next year, might be a good idea to skip yourself yeah. because you yeah. you might if you lose to another crew you might lose a seating so it, uh, <laughs> you can be cynical yeah. if you want to yeah. mm. but I think the, 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 the other thing is say say the Australians win <laughs> they won this year in some mm. uh, or the New Zealand it's probably better or better so they won and they don't come to anything but what will but, but, but the, uh, most of the other boats are there. So what you'll actually get is a re-ranking of the mm. people that are there. Mm. So New Zealand may still no, end up number one, but if you have a good season here, you'll end up number two. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah. So yeah. you know but you will move your ranking mm. anyway. Uh. People will want to race this mm. year. Yeah, we but uh, now you would cut, uh, say, there was an unbeaten crew up to the semi-final and there's a top crew. I don't know what was wrong with the. Australian, Australian four. If you take the world championships, they will be not seated. Uh -huh. They are in, in yeah. it's only uh -huh. ten crews. Uh -huh. So that means then you're bringing already. <laughs> uh -huh. I understand that, but, but for the second and third crew, they have done bad luck. But I think the thing is that we find quite a lot of things change year to year. Yeah. So the Australians and New Zealanders tend to come into the regattas very fast, but they don't necessarily put on any more boat speed. Whereas, particularly the northern Europeans, quite often come in slow and get faster, and then have a big, you know, have a bigger percentage change. Now we can't, we know that, but we can't. No, no, you can't. And you, you shouldn't. <laughs> we, can you, we must apply the. Saying maybe there should be. A a note somewhere you take something in consideration from the yeah. Olympic years yeah. racing. Yeah. And if but, but people coming or not coming can't be always their advantage. No, because no, no. it's a disadvantage. Yeah. If I, I, nobody comes on, okay, I, I go away. Yeah. I yeah. Race in, yeah. in Duisburg, I race in Ghent, and yeah. that is enough. I'm seated and that's yeah. fine. Yeah. It shouldn't be an advantage. Yeah. But, but if you look at the extremes, one extreme is to have some mathematical system that you have points for every rower and the point system mm. determines the seating. And the like other hand tennis. is yes. Mm. And the other hand is uh, that we have a smart commission that's taking all the notes in account, and it's a bit of a fuzzy, uh, maybe even uh, difficult to, to understand system for seating. 
that's the other end. And, and I'm not sure what, what, what's the best solution because you want to have some consideration in certain cases, but maybe others say, well, we have these points, and, and why consider this for this crew? It's, it makes it not very difficult, not easy to, uh, to, to do. No, uh, it's quite often easy to see the top seeds. It's more murky in the middle. No, no, no. Because um, that's where you'll see we've got the differences. We've probably got one, two, and three seeds at the same. And then it might be the same boats, but we'll have them in different order. Or there'll be one boat that somebody has gone, oh, actually, did you remember that they did this here? Because it, 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 it might sound obvious to look at the stuff and it must be easy. But the other thing is that, crew, that I'm really surprised at how much people change their crews. More and more. I think yeah. it changed more and more. And the result from the World Cup 1, World Cup 2, and World Cup 3 are so different. And also the different on the World Championships. No, I, I don't have to go yeah. down to mm, yeah. just thinking and the uh, Olympics is a yeah. big, big part of yeah. it. Yeah. This war, we already discussed yeah. spending yeah. a lot of time mm. here with mm. the wind coming and how we doing. Yeah. And that is, okay, we are yeah. out of sport, I have mm. no problems about it. Yeah. Like yeah. to what I feel, what I feel is that uh, seeding is more and more important, and uh, the, the people are everybody look very strictly to the seeding. No, it's very helpful. Yeah. And I think the, the pressure of the <laughs> yeah the yeah, the, yeah. But, uh, yeah the pressure of the sitting I think is uh, more and more hard. Maybe some people are also valuing too, too much. It's, it's only for mm. Okay, mm. making mm. the results. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Mm. <laughs> and I guess it's then, kind of easy also to look at statistics, statistics retrospectively yeah. to see if the seating has. Oh, usually we have we you have the results of. 90% right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. yeah. But what is good is that we don't get it 100% because otherwise we wouldn't bother going to any events. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we, we want to have those Absolutely, surprises. I, I totally agree. Yeah. Oh. And, and also that it should be, when you, when you look look at the statistics retrospectively, it sh you should uh, uh, hope that seeding you could be able to look that seeding doesn't have so much impact on the results because you could actually have if seeding has everything to say mm -hmm. then, you sh then, then, then you could actually seed people to results yes. so, mm. so it, it's very important that the seeded crews are also the best rowers the, the fastest crews mm. that are better so seeding doesn't so seeding doesn't affect the results because it, uh, they shouldn't. You should be able. To, you should. You should be able to be unseated in when you come to the. Yeah. Yeah. To, yeah. To, to, to oh. check that. Mm. We do. We do. The only thing to check that is to seat the worst crews, because then we separate the worst crews from the best. Mm. And if the worst crews are winning, mm. then there's something wrong with seating. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So the last uh, picture. So your you is that, that you should have a s group, second group, also. Looking at it should be so a second group. A second group. Yeah, yeah. So to the to the for the Olympics, the crews that are seated are also viewed. Yeah, the are are able to to comment on that. Yeah, yeah. 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 the, the the thing about the World Championships or the Olympics is that the entries close a bit longer. Mm. Um, than they do for the World Cup. Mm. It takes time for the entry to come in, for it to mm. be verified and for us to get it. Mm. But well, that's why we were able to publish the lint seeding, I think, on the Monday or Monday, Tuesday yeah. before the weekend. So, um, but the problem is, we don't have, we can't do it three weeks in advance and then give it to you because mm. we. No, no, no. no, but if yeah. the both. Actually, mm. we will know yeah. who the entries are. If the both were very. If the boats were very stable, so we if the boats were very stable, you could actually have a ranking. Yeah, yeah. yeah. but that only works if everybody goes to the same regattas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but you could, you could, you could still change places. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, yeah. yeah. I mean, no, that's uh, sort of what we're doing. Mm. Mm. 
Okay. Go okay. Right. So what what do you think then, Jürgen, would it work if because we will know who's going to the Olympics, so we won't know because they'll have to be they'll have to have their nominations in by a certain date. It's quite early, isn't it? Do you think then that it would be helpful to um, ask some coaches to have a look at it? Well, I think so. Mm. Can you go through the qualification regatta and still be seated? Yes. Uh, well, no, not really. Uh, oh. Well, it depends. So, um, <laughs> last time, uh, Emma Twig went through the qualification Yeah, and I'll regatta, double as well. And I think she ended up being seeded, but I think that's because she then ra oh. she raced in a World Cup as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah but uh, uh, I think that the Norway, we were actually number, number two in the first regatta, I think. Oh, okay. mm. I don't know if we will see it yeah. on the Olympics. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Back the uh, uh, and, uh, if, if, but if you just do the qualification, yeah, uh, I guess else, yeah, 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 that, that would be more difficult. But still, still if, if you win from the number two, who has done some World Cup, and yeah. you have a winning over a, a yeah. certain mm. group, then, mm. then you can still be seated. Mm. Yeah, and we, and we have also the European Championships. So it depends. Actually. Yeah, well, yes, the rest of the world so don't have It depends also on the European yeah. 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 Okay. The rest of the field is not no, we no, trust still the commission. Yeah. Results, yeah. maybe, yeah. 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 Y
and then they've had illness, and we've known they've had illness, mm. and they've underperformed. Um, we have to be careful that we know a good reason for that, mm. to, to not just demote them, mm. because it could also be that the boat has actually you know, gone their fastest, and mm. now they're on the downwards slope. Mm. But, um, I mean, we had uh, one of the... One of the Croatians or was swapped out of the boat late on at the last World Cup, and they got to the they got to the B final, um, but didn't you know? So we could have said no, you're not seeded. Mm -hmm. But the fact that as the two brothers they won everything on the way through, mm -hmm. then we actually still seeded them for, mm -hmm. as the brothers mm -hmm. exactly. Uh -huh. Okay, so we didn't but so them. Uh -huh. cool, yeah, but yeah. you have to cut out as much as possible. So it's if you start that, then everyone yeah, 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 yeah. No, I'm sure nobody would, would complain about yeah. that. Mm -hmm. <coughs> every, every regatta, an opportunity for seeding next year. The Europeans as well. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. So the Europeans, uh, but we obviously have to be careful that we don't end up. Uh, we don't end up a, um, alienating. Um, what's the word? Um, Disadvantaging the cruise of overseas. Yeah, but you can change so the basis. Like yeah, of the European boat. The you know the South Africans win the mm. men's four, mm. um, and they are then sit. They would still stay seeded number one, mm. but the places of the yeah. Europeans will change yeah. going into the European mm. Championships. Mm. Do you still use uh, non-free side events for seeding? Um, we we use take never RT for Paris mm. because there isn't really anything. Is that that useful for? Uh, uh, sometimes we will use um, for, the, mm, for, the for, for the World Cup because, because sometimes there will be boats that have gone there and then when we see them they are racing the first World Cup and they've had quite different results or the different crews from the year before so sometimes we'll look at that because it does say we can use other events mm. but we wouldn't use and we actually used Duisburg last year because I think you and Dutch and, um, there was quite a few countries went to yeah. that. So check, yeah. check. Yeah, so we had a look at Duisburg because not many people went to the first World Cup. But we wouldn't use that going into the final, like the World Championships. Mm. That's only right early in the season right. when we don't have any other information. Mm. All right. Yeah. And uh, last picture. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so we, we, we uh, use yeah uh, only two boat seating, uh, the ranking, the heat allocation. I think you know that. The lane allocation by random draw for all the crews. The result of the seating. We talk about this, but uh, most of the seeding crews are in the finals. It's a good thing. It's a question to bring that together. So if you, from the Fairness Commission, already in the first race, you yes. said, OK, we're using, uh, you, you're using then the seeded crew, you can start straight away, give them the best, best lanes? No. no. Only if we have a time trial, okay, the time seeded trial. goes, crews okay. go first. But not if even in the same situation as you would race the heats mm -hmm. with the question mark, yeah. and you see as laney, mm -hmm. doesn't matter, yeah? yeah? Okay, but then you get the revolution from the... Uh, from the probably if, if, mm -hmm. if there's uh, unfair conditions at the heat, then we go quicker to the time trial because okay, we, then we have go fair, straight away. Yeah, that, that's what we because yeah. we don't want if you start wrong then you're lost for the rest of the time. No, Which is lost why we all did all the moral yeah. of that. Yeah. 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 So so we want to avoid an unfair heats and if we can't avoid them we do time trials. Okay. And that's yeah. why in Rotterdam we actually did something that we'd never done before and said we've got to go to and time trial because we couldn't it, we we would have just been building you know, bad results on bad yeah. results on mm -hmm. bad results, otherwise. And there's a time trial, I think, can we not make it more simple and not having a standing start? Um, and we uh, well, that's possible, that, but then that, we have the timing system on the, on the 100 meters, and we didn't have that in mm -hmm. No, okay, yeah. yeah, but can we not prepare that for the Olympics? Um, it shouldn't we, be a big should problem. Be. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's not easier we, we have coming been talking, than that. that. We've been talking about time uh, trials yeah, in, in, in London, I believe, yeah. for half a day mm. with yeah. the media. I said, well, what can we do to, to make it more attractive on television? 
And the, their advice was, well, if you do time trials, we don't, we don't come. And, uh, and since then, they haven't spent one minute improving their presentation of time trials. Oh. Um, right, guys, sorry, we have to go because they've got to set up the, the last picture, the, the, last picture. the, the, venue, the venue of Vers sur Marne. Very good. But you have to prepare it, and they don't want to. Formula One or what? The issue in. We have asked them if we can have. We've asked them. So in Linz, they said they didn't have enough room. In uh, Tokyo, we've been told we can't have anything at all. Um, so we. They are would have more room if they take the 100 meter away. Mm. Do a 1900 meter. Yeah. Time. Yeah. No. No. We understand that. We we are keen to have a, a running time trial because in Rotterdam. For the eight, it was taking like two, oh, two and a half minutes. Yeah, too, too, too much time to. Yeah. But I yeah. think, yeah. I, think yeah. I have an idea to attach, attach it to the wires. You can attach to well, the wires. Uh, can I just say, if you'd like to suggest it to FISA and Swiss Time, yeah, you'd like. I will. <laughs> Medical side uh, change. Yeah. Okay, it's good the visa makes maybe and, and they discuss it all in the Congress. Yeah. But you have to see always the location. Yes. You know, if you have in the middle the voting mm. area or on the end, how long? If they say just 20 minutes, then it's the most time not possible. Or there's already alarms there. Take somebody. They should go in that direction. One way, they be so sentimental uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> to give them a race in the road challenges. And then, if somebody is really ill, then they find a really feel sorry for the